Patrick's Day celebration. It's a good to have appreciation for all cultures, even though we're African Americans, but it's a good thing for them to learn early. But just a happy day. Everyone should celebrate. Wonderful tradition. As in years past, the fire department rolled out some of its retired trucks. They belong to our historical society, so it's a chance for them to show what we're displaying in our museum in Hollywood and hopefully attract some people to come out and visit our facilities as well. There were also some antique squad cars and the police department's Emerald Society bagpipe band performed. Now, unfortunately, because of the city's budget crisis, there was no actual parade this year. But the celebration did go on, thanks in part to AEG and LA Live. Everything's donated today. So uh, I'm not sure what the police are charging us, but I don't think it's too bad. So we picked up the expenses. Councilman Tom LaBarge says by canceling the parade, the city saved thousands of dollars. It's very it's scaled back because we're not closing the streets. I, I would guess it was anywhere from 70 to 100,000 dollars to close Main Street. While just about everyone seemed to enjoy the party, one longtime resident said this year's celebration wasn't quite the same. I can remember uh, being on a committee that would help coordinate our fire department apparatus with other firemen and with the police department in uh, in setting up the parade, and it was it was something that uh, I was sad, sad to see go this year. In downtown Los Angeles, I'm Anita Bennett for LA This Week. This is the 11th year that the city has hosted a St. Patrick's Day celebration. Meanwhile, Iranian Americans are also celebrating an important day on their cultural calendar as well, the Persian New Year, also known as No Ruse. Cindy San Luis was on hand at City Hall for the festivities. In their own words, they say, it is the spring and it is the New Year's for all human beings around the world. They celebrate for everyone. For the seventh year in a row, Councilman Tony Cardenas is sponsoring one of the city's most colorful celebrations, No Ruse, Persian New Year. I said, not only are we going to give you a resolution, but we're going to celebrate it in the council chambers and make it official. And we're also going to do something in the rotunda. If you want, have a celebration there. Los Angeles is home to the largest population of Iranians outside of Iran. We are very proud of the uh, large uh, Iranian population in Los Angeles, their contributions uh, to medicine and science and engineering and so many business and so many professions. A few members of the Persian-American community were recognized for their positive contributions, including a judge and the first Iranian-American graduate from West Point. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. The celebration of Naruj at City Hall is very special for Jimmy Delshad, the mayor of Beverly Hills. I think it's a wonderful recognition of what the Iranian community has done in America. And one way to do that is to recognize this big celebration because it's not a celebration of religion. It's not a celebration of anything else. It's a celebration of no beginning. Naruj comes from Old Persia and literally means a new day. Now the Persian New Year is always started on the first day of spring at the equinox. The beginning of a new life, the beginning of spring, and... It means a lot to me and my family. The tradition of Naruj dates as far back as 15,000 years ago and will continue to be a sign of peace and prosperity for years to come. From City Hall, I'm Cindy Samalis for LA This Week. Between work and other responsibilities, it can be hard to find time for good deeds such as donating blood. But as Rasha Goel tells us, the city of Los Angeles recently made it easy for employees to roll up their sleeves. City employees didn't have to choose between donating blood and going to work. That's because city leaders made it possible to donate blood during work hours at a recent City Hall blood drive. I work at City Hall. It's, it's so convenient. I just do it every time you come. With each one pint of blood, it can help save three lives. So it's a lot of lives saved. The American Red Cross City Hall blood drive is held four times a year for two consecutive days. And according to the American Red Cross, it's easy, convenient, and safe. You cannot catch anything from giving blood. You're helping save lives. In the Los Angeles area alone, there is a shortage of blood and an urgent need for O negative and B negative types. O negative is universal and can be transfused to any patient regardless of their own blood type. Let's say if you have a patient that needs something um, different, we can use O until we get the blood type that that person needs. Being a donor is a very privileged position 
So I continue to do so and hopefully it will help somebody. And for these city employees, donating blood means only having to take a few minutes away from work to save lives. From City Hall, I'm Rasha Goel for LA This Week. The American Red Cross City Hall Blood Drive is held every three months. This one was sponsored by Councilwoman Jan Perry's office. While some take it for granted that they have several grocery stores to choose from within just a few blocks, some South Los Angeles residents are celebrating the opening of a market that's giving them options they didn't have before. Yana Kay reports. One, two, three. The ribbon cutting ceremony makes it official. The very first fresh and easy market is now open for business in South LA. Yeah, it's so beautiful. I love it. With the help of the city's community redevelopment agency and other organizations, this 10,000 square foot fresh and easy becomes the second new grocery store to open on Central Avenue in recent years. No longer will people have to travel long distances to access what everybody should have as a matter of course. A grocery store with fresh fruits, vegetables, nice meat choices right here in our own backyard. Not only is the market in a convenient location at Adams and Central, but it also offers shoppers more fresh and healthy options. People are more cons you know, conscious of this kind of uh, behavior about eating healthier, so I think it's, it's the time, you know, we're in that time where people are being more health conscious. This new Fresh and Easy store has only been open for about an hour, and the aisles here are absolutely jam-packed with shoppers. They say the best thing that they love about the store is that the high quality products come at really affordable prices. Check this out. These bananas are 19 cents each. Can't beat that. We believe that everybody deserves access to fresh, wholesome food at affordable prices, regardless of where they live. And there's a tremendous opportunity in neighborhoods that are underserved. Fresh and Easy also takes pride in giving back to the community it serves. At this grand opening celebration, a $1,000 donation was given to the LA Works program. Fresh and Easy has also created 300 jobs in California, 20 of them at this store. Why these jobs matter, why this project matters, in my view, is it sets the model for Los Angeles of the future. And with this new market opening, officials hope that model of the future will be a healthy one. For LA This Week, I'm Yana Kay. Fresh and Easy is owned by Tesco, a company based in the United Kingdom. One local nonprofit group is aiming to stop child poverty, homelessness, and the lack of educational opportunities through an art exhibit and conference. Anna Marcos explains. The artwork and exhibits go to support a special cause, the cause of children. Para los Niños, a group that helps kids in LA's most poverty stricken neighborhoods, is teaming up with the first Presbyterian nursery school in Santa Monica to host the exhibit. We serve the tough neighborhoods. That's who we are and what we do. Um, the economically challenged, the at-risk children, the families that are out of work or out of home. One of the things that we do at Para Los Niños is really emphasize the arts and sciences. This is the first LA visit for the exhibit called The Wonder of Learning, the Hundred Languages of Children. Para Los Niños has also staged a three-day conference to focus on education alternatives and on the idea of schools as community learning centers. We're born with immense amounts of potential, right? We have to trust children's intelligence. And then the environment is there to produce optimal growth. So the two interact. As one of its missions, Para Los Niños works to make the streets more livable for homeless kids, who now make up 8% of LA's homeless population. There's a school and after-school services now on Skid Row. Council member Jan Perry says, the program has had a huge impact on children there. They don't just deal with books and numbers and figures of educating a child. This organization takes a holistic approach. While they don't have immediate access to the ocean or maybe to the Getty on the other side of the 405 freeway, they do have immediate access to seafood factories, flower markets, and emerging art galleries that are here right in the community in downtown Los Angeles. For more information on Para Los Niños and all its activities, visit www.paralosniños.org. I'm Anna Marcos for LA This Week. One class of Para Los Niños third graders recently took up President Barack Obama's call to action and raised a thousand dollars to give to the Midnight Rescue Mission. It's just one example of the Para Los Niños motto that schools can empower children and their communities. One local TV station gets a very late Christmas present. Recognition from the LA City Fire Department for a job well done. Gil Reyes explains. 
Though spring has officially sprung, ABC7 weather expert Garth Kemp will tell you the warmth of the holiday season is still with him. It's fun. It's, if you ask me if I'd like to get up in an elf outfit, Probably I'd say no, but probably I'd say yeah, it's probably because we like doing it. Praise for ABC Television and its annual Spark of Love toy drive, as people dropped off some 90,000 new toys at firehouses citywide. And this tough economy hasn't stopped firefighters and volunteers from giving their time and efforts at fire stations like this one. In fact, people seemingly are more willing to give during these tough economic times. Everything I find mostly during the year, though, is... The people usually with the less are the ones that give the most. Very strange. You know, rarely do I see multimillionaires coming out dumping toys off. But which is a good thing. So yeah, I think people do. I think people that don't have a lot figure it out. The LA City Fire Department is also facing cuts. Fifteen less fire trucks and five less ambulances in their fleet since last summer. With possibly more service cuts to come, depending on a city council vote. Well, obviously, uh, we don't have the, the resources, monetary resources, to assign folks to this. But we have uh, firefighters that volunteer, and then firefighters that work on their day off from the fire station to, uh, to work to make this program really function well. Firefighters stretching services when lives and the hearts of children are on the line. Not just at Christmas, but all year long. Gil Reyes for LA This Week. Jack's Pacific Toys and Target stores also pitched in to help make the toy drive a success. Firefighters distributed the toys to needy children throughout Southern California. Several standout members of the LAPD Central Division are also being recognized for being the best at what they do. Mike Kaufman takes us to the awards ceremony. It was quite a day for LAPD's finest at the Central City Boosters Awards Luncheon at the Wilshire Grand Hotel. Central Boosters, now in its 37th year, not only help support the department, but also youth in the community. We help provide training materials, training days, uh, bike parts, repair things that the city can no longer or cannot provide for the officers in order to do their job. Police Chief Charlie Beck was on hand to see six people be honored for going above the call to help support the station and the community. Central Area proudly recognizes Detective Joshua Riggs as the Detective of the Year. Detective Joshua Riggs was humbled by being selected as Detective of the Year. I feel like um, there's a lot of people that could have gotten it, and I'm very uh, honored to be picked as the Detective of the Year. Sergeant Casi Chavez was honored as Supervisor of the Year. Anthony Gutierrez was selected as Police Officer of the Year. And an award was also given out for the Reserve Officer of the Year. It, it's awesome. It's awesome. It, you know, it, it is an honor, and uh, I really wasn't expecting it. Because uh, it's something that I love to do. Councilwoman Jan Perry shared her support and pride for the LAPD Central Division. They are among the best trained, um, the most uh, enthusiastic uh, division in the city because of the diversity of public safety issues that they face. Also honored were Honoré Rausch as Civilian Employee of the Year and Diana Ugalde as Citizen Volunteer of the Year. From downtown LA, I'm Mike Kaufman for LA This Week. For information about the Central City Police Boosters, go to www.centralcityboosters.org. A pie bake sale to help preserve the view of the Hollywood sign, a rate increase for LADWP customers, and putting a stop to lewd conduct at local parks. These stories and more in City Beat. <laughs> In an effort to save the Kawanga Peak on which the famed Hollywood sign rests, the Beachwood Canyon Neighborhood Association held a Pies for the Peak bake sale in which some 30 homemade pies were sold for $30 apiece. The Trust for Public Land is working with Councilmember Tom LaBonge's office and residents to raise the money needed to purchase the land behind the Hollywood sign to protect it from development. We need our local communities to get together, do things like this, a little bit of money you think you're going to make. I know I made over close to 2,000 on pies today. We were sold out. So it takes just one little effort to make a big, big difference. The $2,000 also included merchandise sales and cash donations. To date, the Trust for Public Land has raised half of the $12.5 million it needs by mid-April to purchase the land. Mayor Antonio Villaraigosa has proposed a carbon reduction surcharge that would eventually cost LA Department of Water and Power customers an additional $2.5 a month and hike rates for some businesses by about 20%. 
The mayor says the money would help fast-track the city's switch from coal to renewable energy while creating about 18,000 green jobs over a decade. A city council committee is looking over the proposal. Los Angeles Police Department Northeast Division vice officers are investigating ongoing acts of lewd conduct that are occurring in Elysian Park, Griffith Park, and Sycamore Grove Park in northeast Los Angeles. The problem is one of uh, men who come into the parks, uh, usually during all hours of the day and night, uh, and where they meet strangers to engage in anonymous sex. These are photos taken of the trash-strewn parks in the aftermath of these encounters. Though this activity has been occurring for many years, LAPD officers are especially concerned about a recent trend in which participants are targeted for robbery and assault by local gang members. Numerous complaints from people utilizing the parks are also a contributing factor. The LA City Council has passed a proposal introduced by Council President Eric Garcetti that reduces taxes on Internet-based businesses. Because Internet-based businesses can operate anywhere in the world, Garcetti said it's important to incentivize those companies to remain in Los Angeles. Garcetti's proposal created a new tax category for Internet-based businesses, which had previously been included in a broader business classification that's taxed at a higher rate. The Los Angeles Department of Water and Power encourages young people to explore careers in the sciences. They do so by hosting a science competition every year. Rasha Goel reports. 250 students, 42 teams competed for the first place at the 18th annual LA Department of Water and Power Science Bowl Regional Competition. The competition encourages high school students to pursue careers in math, science, and technology. In, in cultivating this level of excellence, you help ensure the future uh, of all of us. Uh, science is a tool for survival. The competition was open to public, charter, and private high school students. The eventful day ended with Granada Hills Charter and North Hollywood High Schools going head-to-head -head in a television game show style competition. At normal temperature and pressure, which of the following gases will show the largest deviation from ideal gas behavior? Our regional competition have won four national titles and placed among the top five teams nationally in nine out of the last 15 years. And the winner was North Hollywood High. Hopes are this year these brilliant young minds will also place at the National Science Bowl in Washington, D.C. in April. From Los Angeles, I'm Rasha Goel for L.A. This Week. The LADWP is one of the few utilities in the nation to serve as a regional sponsor and host for the Science Bowl competition. It's a Los Angeles landmark on wheels that's over 100 years old, but one that's operated on and off several times throughout the century. But that landmark, Angel's Flight, has once again reopened to the public, and I went there on inaugural day to take a ride. It's one minute and three seconds of nostalgia. Touted as the shortest railway in the world, the 325 feet ride between Hill Street across from the Grand Central Market and California Plaza on Grand Avenue brings back a world of memories for those who had ridden the train back in the days. I've ridden this since I was about three years old. My father would bring me and we'd go up and down, up and down for hours. I think it cost about a nickel back then. I won't say when. <laughs> We're riding in Sinai. Sinai and its twin railway car, Olivet, have been around since 1905, just four years after Angel's Flight opened to the public. Everything else that you don't see, the tracks and all the mechanical systems, are all new and improved. And it seems that even on the first official day of its relaunch, Angel's Flight has already spurred some regional tourism. We came on the Amtrak uh, Metrolink from San Bernardino to L.A., and we went to... Uh, little Tokyo first to have lunch and then we came over here from the go line to the red line and came over here to ride uh, Angel Flight. So why all the excitement for the reopening of the funicular train? Well, between 1901 and present day, Angel's Flight experienced a lot of change, including a change in location, a 27-year period of inoperation, and even an accident in 2001 that killed an elderly man and led to its most recent nine-year closure until now. It has that sense of permanence in Los Angeles. It's something that has been here for a long time. Now, it hasn't been here for the last nine years, so as a result, we're actually an economic stimulus. Much like Grand Central Market and Clifton's Market, everything in L.A. is, you know, old is becoming new again. So this is fabulous. I'm so glad it's back. 
And best of all, even the cost of a ride brings back nostalgia. It's just 25 cents one way. And if that's still too much for you, well, you can always take the stairs. The foundation raised $3.5 million on its own to be able to reopen Angel's Flight. They are also working with the Bureau of Street Services to receive a federal grant. After you take a ride on Angel's Flight, head on over to a couple of local parks as flowers and trees in bloom usher in spring. That's in this week's list of things to do. How do you know when spring's in the air? When you see and smell the roses in bloom at the Exposition Park Rose Garden. The city's renowned public horticultural facility will have one new rose variety this season called Easy Does It. You can also expect to see about 5,600 rose bushes and 140 different styles of roses on display now that the annual pruning has been completed. The Exposition Park Rose Garden is located at 701 State Drive and is open daily from 9 a.m. to sunset. And not to be outdone by the roses, cherry blossoms at Lake Balboa in Encino are likely to also be at their peak around this time. Donated by an anonymous benefactor from Japan, the trees originated from a single tree. The Department of Recreation and Parks began planting them in 1992. Now 1,000 pink cloud cherry blossom trees dot the 80-acre Lake Balboa. Lake Balboa is located at 6300 Balboa Boulevard in Encino. And it's all about nature in this week's installment of Things to Do. How about helping to plant a tree on your day off? If you live in northwest San Fernando Valley, consider joining your neighbors, the local Chamber of Commerce, Councilmember Dennis Zine, and Million Trees LA in planting trees to beautify the community. It takes place Saturday, March 27th at 8 a.m. Participants are asked to meet at the Holiday Inn located at 21101 Ventura Boulevard in Woodland Hills. To volunteer or for more information, call Million Trees LA at 213-473-9950. And that's a look at some upcoming things to do. That's going to do it for this edition. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ellen Chang. A reminder that you can catch us online at lecityview.org. We'll leave you with another look at Angel's Flight. See you back here next week for more of LA This Week. segundos me va a atropellar un carro siempre vuelta a los dos lados antes de cruzar maneja con cuidado donde hay niños presentes la seguridad en las carreteras es responsabilidad de todos atención en las carreteras Key item pickup? Call 311, the toll free number for non emergency services. 311, your one call to City Hall. G'day, Troy McCubbin from North Hollywood. You're watching LA City View, Channel 35, our city, our channel.
something council needs to be briefed by the mayor. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Los Angeles City Council meeting for Tuesday, March 23rd, 2010. We're here in the John Farrell Council Chambers, room 340 of City Hall. Welcome those members of the public and city employees who have joined us here today in Council Chambers, as well as those who are viewing us on Channel 35. Channel 35 broadcasts these meetings throughout the city's cable system, uh, live and rebroadcasts the taped versions each Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. Um, Council President Eric Garcetti and I am joined today by my colleagues, uh, Council Members Alicorn, Cardenas, Coretz, Parks, Perry, Reyes, Smith, and Zine. Um, the following members are late. Council Members Hahn, Wiesar, uh, Labange, Rosendahl, and Wesson. Mr. Krikorian has just joined us. Um, we do have a quorum. So we'll begin in just a moment. A couple other housekeeping items. We are available as well online for your convenience. Uh, you can navigate to the city's homepage at lacity.org and click on the links to uh, live streaming webcasts of our council meetings. Uh, we also archive all of our past council meetings, so you can watch those online. And linked to those um, are also the um, uh, supporting materials for all of the items that we vote on. Those are available for the public and for anybody else uh, to view the same uh, reports and analyses that the council receives as well. Um, finally, uh, if folks would like to read our agendas, those are made available here in City Hall, uh, posted uh, downstairs here through the City Clerk's Office or also online, um, as well as a schedule of our committee hearings. Items on our agendas are divided between those, uh, those items that have had public hearings already and those that have not. If you'd like to be heard on any of those items, please uh, fill out a speaker card in the back and hand it to one of the Sergeants at Arms for items that have already had a public hearing, it requires a council member to reopen that, um, which uh, if not, does not happen, we do not have a second public hearing. But any items that have not yet had a public hearing will automatically be triggered by a card from the public. Finally, we have a, a section of the meeting for general public comment, um, and that is uh, made available uh, through cards here or in Van Nuys and San Pedro, where we can remotely hear your comments as well. With that, Mr. Clerk, if you'll please call the roll. Alicorn, Cardinal Hahn, Weezer, Koretz, Gregorian, LaBange, Parks, Bay, Reyes, Rosendahl, Smith, Weston, Zion, Garcetti, 10 members present, and a quorum is present. Okay. First order of business, please. Approval of the minutes. All right. Mr. Uh, Smith moves and Mr. Reyes seconds without objection. Those will be approved. Next item. Commendatory resolutions for approval. All right. Uh, Mr. Cardenas moves. Mr. Coret seconds without objection. Those will be approved as well. This is, this is Tuesday and there is the flag salute. Okay. Uh, Mr. Krikorian, would you be kind enough to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance if I could ask everybody to please rise for our salute to the flag. Thank you. Please rise and join me in saluting our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, if we can run through the agenda, uh, please. First item on the agenda, item one is a street lighting district notice for public hearing. Uh, council should continue the hearing and present the ordinance on April 13th. Okay. Without objection, that will be continued to the 13th. Next item, please. Item two is an item for which public hearing has been held, and I believe there is a request to continue that one day to March 24th. Okay. Without objection, we'll continue item two until um, tomorrow. Next items, please. Items three and four are items to which public hearings have not been held. Ten votes are required for consideration. Okay, we do have cards from both those. We'll call those special for cards from the public. If there's no objection to consideration, seeing none, um, we will call those special for cards. Next items, please. On the supplemental agenda, item five is an item for which public hearing has been held. Okay. Um, anybody wishing to call five special? Uh, Mr. Parks? And next item. Item six is an item for which public hearing has not been held. Ten votes are required for consideration. Okay, if there's no objection, uh, we'll call that special. There's cards from the public and Ms. Perry as well. Um, is this call that special. Um, that will take us to our general public comment. This is for items that are not on today's agenda. Sometimes folks put in cards um, and then speak on things that are on the agenda. We can just put those back in for those specific items. But just as a reminder, this is for items that are not on the agenda, but nevertheless under the jurisdiction of the city. Um, our first speaker is Jacob Miller. I'd like to come forward, and after that is Pamela Tuttle. Mr. Miller here? Jacob Miller? Okay, we'll hold his card for a second. Is Ms. Tuttle here? I think he's here. Oh, there's Mr. Miller. He's coming forward. You're the first speaker for a general public comment. Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Jacob Miller. I work for Department of Animal Services, have been for the uh, last uh, eight and a half years. 
you and crowd service. Just wanted to uh, talk to you guys today about an integral part of public safety, uh, and that would be animal services. And I just wanted to remind everybody that a minor, even a minor cut to animal services uh, would have a, a cascading effect on the city and its public safety. When I first started with this department, uh, there were lots of people who used to leave their homes with big sticks because they weren't afraid of the gangs, they were afraid of uh, packs of wild dogs running around biting people. If we see even a minor cut to animal services, we're going to be looking at more of these dogs, more of these dog packs cropping up. And this is going to be, uh, this is going to be something that's going to cause bites to the children and the elderly. The other issue that I want to speak to you today about is about our licensed canvassers. And I know a number of the uh, council members went out on a limb to uh, vote to give us uh, the uh, language necessary to obtain the uh, list of uh, where dogs are located from the DWP. Currently, I guess they're working out the uh, final details on it. However, a lot of us see this as kind of uh, like, the, like our administration is kind of running down the clock uh, as we move towards uh, July 1st. As it stands right now, the order's been put out to uh, go ahead and lay off these canvassers. We feel it's very important that uh, the city council uh, takes a stance on this and uh, tries to do what they can to keep these canvassers because what's going to end up happening is we're going to have a list from DWP and nobody to canvass for it. Currently, these people visit 50 homes a day each, which means uh, by the end of the next fiscal year, they'll visit another 104,000 homes. Currently, they make over 100% of their salaries, a little bit around $320,000. We feel that uh, even a safe estimate to give for the fiscal year 2010-2011 would be roughly $400,000. And the sky is really the limits if uh, certain hurdles can be removed for these folks to be able to do their jobs more effectively, such as allowing them to uh, take credit card transactions out in the field, making it a little bit easier for an officer to show up to issue citations when it's necessary. Thank you very much, and I would like to uh, thank you all for your time and support and uh, just spending an ear to hear what we have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Thank you for your service as well. Uh, Pamela Tuttle is our next speaker. After that is Frank Tamburello. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. Sorry. Actually, I wanted to comment on um, item, item six. six. Okay. okay. We'll, we'll put it in there for that. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Uh, Frank Tamburello. Mr. Tamburello here. Okay. Uh, John Walsh. John Walsh, it's a pleasure to speak in front of the men and women who keep our lights on. You do a fantastic job. The only time I ever lost my electricity in Hollywood was the day a thunderbolt hit a vault. 35 years of electricity. And I want to say to everyone out there, if you have electricity on now, it's because of these people here. HollywoodHighlands.org. I want to thank the media, the TV electronic media that was hit with a nasty little USC attack saying that you only cover the government of the city of Los Angeles for 22 seconds. John North has been covering it for over 22 years. It's the LA Times that doesn't cover what's going on in this city. HollywoodHighlands.org for my blog. I have had, since September 3rd of last year, 400,000 visitors. So it's not just me, it's 400,000. And I want to point out that we, have, we didn't have an L.A. Marathon yesterday. We had a Tri-City Marathon. We had a White Marathon. The people in Beverly Hills, remember when the marathon went to East L.A.? Well, they don't want that. Of course, they can't get corporate sponsorship. So now the marathon goes to Santa Monica. And who was there in Santa Monica to greet them when they arrived? 80% of the people who run in those marathons are white. Because minorities realize that it's stupid to run around in the street. And you get a heart attack. This is becoming, ever since minorities became the majority in the city, the white people and the liberals are out to destroy you. Hollywood, and, and cut your salary. Hollywood. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Uh, Joanne M. Ivanek Garb is our next speaker. After that will be Chris Rowe. Good morning. Good morning. Can we just move I the microphone down a little so we can hear you better? Thank you. Okay. 
Um, I wanted to give Mr. Koretz and Mr. Krikorian one of our West Hills neighborhood bags since they haven't received one yet. And I'm Joanne Yavanikar from West Hills Neighborhood Council and I just wanted to warn you, I'm back. Thanks to the constituents of West Hills, I have another term. So I don't know whether I should warn you or just so. But I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations on your re-election. Chris Rowe is your next uh, speaker. And then after that is Mr. Bobby Cooper. Good morning. I am morning. Chris Rowe. And I just had my first election because I had filled a vacancy. And I have a four-year term. So good. look forward to that. Um, I want to, on public comment, address Pierce College today. Council Member Zine is going to be sponsoring a farm walk there. And I want Council Member Zine to be very aware that in 1991, uh, 1991 Joy Pikus and Hal Burnson set aside the area west of Mason as open space, and that isn't a council file. And so when you go over and do this farm walk, they're going to start telling you that they want to block off Mason Street at Olympic Drive. They're going to put in some automotive and um, a green technology building there, and it's going to affect your traffic. So I understand we don't have jurisdiction there, but you have a very good relationship with Pierce, and we don't have an EIA or a mag deck to respond on. The community is not getting to weigh in on the infrastructure. $400 million of Proposition J money. So, Council Member Smith, please, uh, can someone from your office meet with me and discuss these issues? And also, I just want to say that, uh, well, there's a minute left. The, the budget, I realize what you're all going through. I, I appreciate th those of you who have uh, volunteered to take cuts in your salary and just know that when we're not down here we, we are watching you on TV and listening and thank you very much. Thank you Chris. Um, Mr. Bobby Cooper is our next speaker. After that we'll go to Van Nuys and hear from Donna Pearman. Good morning sir. Good morning sir. My name is Mr. Bobby Kenneth Cooper. I'm here today with regards to $5,000 of my money, Wells Fargo Bank taken away from me in 2001, another $10,000 this uh, year of, of um, this year, 2010. I'm unable to get any information in regards to my money because of help, assistance by Rampart Police Department. They seem to run the city. I don't understand what's happening. 15 years in litigation, here it is. 15 years of harassment, three years of litigation with attorney against attorney John Goldwyn and his client, with John Goldwyn not even having the right to practice law in the state of California. He litigated for me from the Superior Court of the State of California, Ninth District, well, the District Los Angeles Federal District Court, uh, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, San Francisco, California, which I was harassed, assaulted, etc. The rest of my agenda on my agenda is uh, the fact that uh, my telephones, fax machine computers being monitored illegally by Rampart Police Department. I can't even tell nobody. Last week I was after speaking with the city council, council county councils, I had a laser. That night going to the store, I got a laser beam on me. Plus the labels are beam. I'm trying to find out who's running the city. I've called the police several times, they hang up in my face. I call 911, they try to put me through, they don't even answer the phone at the desk over with Rampart. Who's running the city? It's ridiculous. I see now that I'm not, I'm going to have to be here next week because I'm not able to present my full agenda today. And I thank you very much for your cooperation. Thank you, sir. If you ever have written materials, we're happy to circulate those as well. Our next speaker is Donna Pearman in Van Nuys. Um, after that, we'll come back to Ivan Curry here in Council Chambers. Good morning, Ms. Pearman. Yeah, good morning, uh, Mr. Garcetti. Anyway, I'm sorry Miriam Foger couldn't be here, but she'll be back. Joel Walsh, and remember sanitation, they've been very good at always uh, uh, taking care of the trash. 
I, I mean, not taking it. I mean, uh, taking care of the sewers. I want to ask the six council members that was listed in the paper. Why do you insist that city employees take a pay cut before you take it? Either you want to sacrifice or you don't. That's simple as that. No brainer. Most of the city employees already do, did sacrifices, not taking cost of living. That's a pay cut in itself. And doing furloughs, raising cost of medicine, it was not, a, but it was not appreciated. Yet you uh, let the uh, DWT take a raise, DWP take a raise. Uh, that they shouldn't have done that. No sacrifice. No sacrifice from the CRA. Michael Moore said the CRA has um, 680 million and growing. The city council um, continues to shield developers and digital billboard companies. Do you know the digital billboard companies? Mr. Rosendahl, they did your two, uh, helped you with your two campaigns, uh, the certain man. You continue to waste all of our money on your pet projects and ask, and, and ask those who didn't cause this problem to bail you out. You wish to hurt all, all Angelinos who will, hurt ser uh, who will lose services. But they didn't cause the problems. The money you um, gave all to the CRA, even the sacrifices you make is okay because you, you make much more than the rest of the people. And uh, you, uh, I've taught uh, 12 years, you make what another person would in a retirement when another city boy has to work 30 years for. You caused the problem with the runaway spending and the CRA. And uh, until you learn to spend your money correctly, you can't ask for one penny. Matter of fact, I think they should, the city police should raise it. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Ivan Curry is our next speaker here in uh, Council Chambers. After that is Carlos Lane. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Council Members. Uh, you know who I am. I'm Ivan Curry. I'm the, one of the animal services canvassers. I'd just like to take a moment and reiterate what the situation is that we have here. It's not just about my job, our job. It's about the citizens out there who have the problems with the dogs. You don't know the countless fires that we have put out because of the dogs in the neighborhoods. You don't know the number of people that don't even know that they're supposed to license their dog until we actually come to the door. So once we do that, they're getting information. Once they get that information, then we collect. Once we collect, we turn it in. Once we turn it in, you add it up. And if you look back at the numbers, it adds up quite a lot. I'm not going to stand here and give you some erroneous figures, but I am saying to you that someone needs to take a closer look at this money generating source here that, that is working if you allow it but if you take it away then what about your children who's walking down the street and this animal is chasing him thank you very much thank you sir and thank you for your service Carlos Lane and then Matt Dowd will follow Mr. Lane good morning sir good morning how are you doing good Thank you. For the last several years, we've been scouring the streets of Los Angeles, uh, searching for unlicensed animals. And so all again, as we have been stating for the last several weeks, is that we just want an opportunity to keep what we have going now. It's obvious that we're a positive effect on the community, we're a positive effect on city revenue, we're a positive effect on our overall stature of our department, because our department is seen differently because there's actually somebody at their door that cares about the health and welfare of their animals. But even more so than that, uh, we are just thankful that we've been given the opportunity to be a service to the community. And the community appreciates us back by licensing their animals. Now, it's pretty obvious that, again, that we have been a positive generating source ever since we've been in our inception. And all we're asking for the city council to do is take a look at what we're doing. Again, not be so quick to jump up and cut us while we're still in our infancy stage of trying to get things correct. We're steady trying new techniques, new things to assist us in collecting for licensing. And so again, there is a, a lot of dogs out there, there's a lot of homeowners who are unaware of the programs that LA Animal Services provide, such as free spay and neutering, low cost vaccinations, uh, 
mobile pet adoption, senior for senior programs. So there's a lot of things that we are doing that the, that the city does not know about because of lack of media attention. But please, all we're asking is to keep the eight of us together for one more fiscal year so we can show you how good of a job we can do. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, and thank you for your service as well. Matt Dowd is our next speaker. After him will be Walter Bechtel. Good morning. All right. Yes, thank you. I just uh, picked up the LA Weekly because we're in LA. I thought, let's what's hap see what's happening this week. It's full of pot, prostitutes, and penis enlargements. And sir, while you're able so, to... So, uh, can... Can't, excuse me. No, no, sir, sir, I'll, I'll make sure you have your time, but if you can please, uh, the one area we've told you before that is not protected language is of a sexual nature, so will you please? <laughs> sir, there's many things printed in LA Weekly, so. Okay, this is a second. Mr. Dowd, you can continue, but please do not use See, words of a sexual nature. Thank you, Channel 35. Once again, it's all legal. If I was a doctor saying that I was concerned because I had one and it went wrong and I want you to crack down on the malpractice because my penis enlargement went wrong and I need it fixed in the city. Sorry, sir. That's your, your last warning. Thank you, Mr. Dowd. Walter Bechtel will be our next speaker. Good morning, sir. Uh, good morning. Uh, I just wanted to come back and uh, wanted and talk about the Ford Hotel. Uh, you know, you bailed it for a couple of weeks ago. I, 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 I asked him what happened to the piano in the back there, and he said somebody removed it. In fact, Mr. LeBron said somebody removed it. And I said, what, what, are they going to bring it back? He said, I think somebody's using it. And uh, uh, a couple of weeks before that, when you, when your bailiff said, uh, when I was sitting at the, the bench back there at the piano, he he said, "Why don't you play it?" And I said, "Well, I don't play an instrument. I do lyrics." And I wanted to correct that. Um, I I do have an instrument, or I did uh, for years. I used the Ford Hotel as my instrument to make lyrics with and we made lyrics with and but you've taken that from me now and I just want to say to the city uh, congratulations uh, there's not going to be any more music like there was during the 1990s and I hope that uh, if there's not going to be any justice in my case there's never going to be any music the way it was before but uh, this isn't the only thing you people ever done to the entertainment industry. You insulted us by removing all the uh, fire ex escapes in the historical district and a very famous fountain that was located on the corner of La Brea and Wilshire Boulevard in the old Columbia Savings Building was removed. I believe it was scrapped for its copper content. It was really retarded because the fountain was worth millions of dollars, but you just cashed in on the, the worth, on the greedy worth of the of the copper. But at least we know who's been stealing the copper in the city anyway. Thank you, Mr. Bechtel. Just to, to state for the record as well, and our previous speaker, Mr. Dowd, while we might have jurisdiction over uh, medical marijuana and, and prostitution, we did not on the third, so it was out of order for that reason as well. Um, Frank Tamborello is our last speaker. Did he come back, Mr. Tamborello? not, that will end our general public comment. Um, Ms. Perry has asked for us to take item number six uh, out of order. I know there are a lot of people that are here for that. We appreciate your time. And in the interest of uh, being as courteous uh, to all the members of the public that are here, I'd like to uh, begin by recognizing the chair of our Energy and Environment Committee and the maker of the motion as well, uh, Ms. Perry. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I would also like to call to my colleagues' attention a single-page letter which I think has been delivered to all of you uh, about what we're doing here today. It's dated March the 23rd, and it's a one-page letter, and it states what I seek through this process. So today we're voting on a motion that was co-authored by Mr. Garcetti and was signed on by five other members of the Los Angeles City Council to assert jurisdiction on an action 
approved by the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power Board on Thursday, March 18, 2010, that changes the current energy cost adjustment factor structure. The resolution passed by the board authorized the modification of the energy cost adjustment factor or ECAF of the electric rate ordinance from 0.1 cent per kilowatt hour to 0.8 cents per kilowatt hour effective April 1, 2010. That's a total of a 2.7 cent increase. This is the largest rate increase in the department's history. By asserting the jurisdiction, the council will be able to, to discuss and fully vet this issue, offering to yourselves and your constituents the benefit of transparency and also to the benefit of the ratepayers. This is important. The council can offer the ratepayers an opportunity to understand this proposal and its implications. I am seeking a transparent process. Ultimately, we have to ultimate we have to understand the need and the impact of these changes for all ratepayers. That would include single families, renters, commercial and industrial users. So, let me summarize what I seek through this process and asserting jurisdiction is transparent and fiscally sound department operations, examination of rates for residential and commercial rate payers, viable job opportunities, a plan that offers a collaborative strategic approach to increasing our renewable portfolio. One way to achieve this is by reconstituting the ECAF into separate simple and easy to understand pieces. There are concerns that holding this matter up will hurt the department's bond rating and revenue transfer, and I will comment on that later. I can assure you that I take these issues very seriously, and if this motion is passed, I'm committed to discussing this issue through the committee process and getting it back to council in an expeditious manner. And in fact, if the council asserts jurisdiction, I plan to schedule an Energy and Environment Committee meeting uh, as early as this Thursday and bring uh, the item back to council as quickly as possible. The bottom line is we need to know more about the implications of this proposed new rate structure. And I am very interested in a frank and direct discussion on the record. To meet the cost of energy after four quarters, the ECAF could result in a 20% increase or higher on a ratepayer's overall bill. This is significant, and this does merit public discussion. Now, PA Consulting is here, and they will speak in a minute after the public speaks, and they reported in my committee last week about their findings. I think that the findings are a good place to start. And uh, after we hear from the public, they will come to the table and discuss their findings and recommendations. Yeah. This consultant group has worked with the council for the past four months to fully assess all ECAF issues and provide us with advice. This is a first critical step to finding the answer on how to proceed with the benefit of a fully informed electorate and a fully informed process. And Mr. President, if you would um, allow the public to speak first before we get into the questions, I would appreciate it very much. Okay. Um, I think what we'll do then, if there's any other introductory statements that colleagues would like to make before we question um, PA or any of the staff members, I have three folks on the queue. I wanted to see if it, that's the nature of these uh, of these comments, Mr. Zion, Mr. Cardenas, Mr. Kretz. Are these of a Okay, why don't we go to public comment then first. We have 31 cards so far at two minutes apiece. Uh, that is about one hour so far of testimony. Um, if folks have already said what uh, you want to say, feel free to speak for less than two minutes, but you have up to two minutes. Um, and we'll have a t uh, timer here to help you guide your time. Pamela Tuttle is our first speaker, and then Carol Schatz is second. And uh, after that will be James uh, Dolzaki. And if folks want to line up, just because we have so many, we can do three at a time lining up. Good morning again. Good morning. Hi. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank you all for the time to speak this morning. And I'd like to thank everyone in this room uh, today for everything that you've said so far. I'm happy to hear that we're all so passionate about so many things. Um, so my name is Pam. I am the organizing director. Uh, today, 
I am representing thousands of students across the state. Um, I'm the organizing director of a student coalition called the California Student Sustainability Coalition with thousands of students across the state that are working to make our campuses sustainable and asking for our school administration to invest in renewable energy. Uh, today I'm here to ask or talk to you about the mayor's commitment to have 40%, invest in 40% renewable energy by 2020. Um, basically the students across California have created their own policy to ask that the UC system invest in 17% renewable energy by 2020 as well. This has made the UC system the eighth largest institutional purchaser of renewable energy in the nation. We ask that the city of Los Angeles follow in this leadership and support the mayor's climate commitment to get 40% renewable energy by 2020. Most, in particular, um, I'm here representing students from USC. USC is the single largest private purchaser of energy in the city of Los Angeles. And we would like to ask for your support in the mayor's commitment. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Carol Schatz is our next speaker. After that is James Dolzaki. If you'd like to come forward after Mr. Dolzaki will be Frank Gallo. Carol Schatz, president of the Central City Association of the Downtown Center BID. Together we represent businesses and property owners that employ over 500,000 people in LA County. We represent over 56 million square feet of property just in downtown Alo and 2,200 parcels. We understand the impact of this issue on the DWP. We support the DWP. But this has critical implications. You must assert jurisdiction. This is an enormous burden on property owners. For our largest property owners in downtown, we are talking about over a million dollar increase a year for this rate increase, coming on a double digit rate increase that just went into effect a year ago. For your hospitals in LA, at least a million dollars a year more in rates because of this rate increase. There is a lot of attention being paid to green jobs. If a property owner cannot meet the expenses because of declining revenue, what happens? Jobs are lost. And that is what's critical here. It is important that we hold on to the jobs in hand instead of looking at the jobs in the renewables bush, which may or may not happen. We urge you to look at the possibilities of restructuring this ECAF, putting in a 0.8 cent increase for a quarter to allow a 90-day review of this entire issue so that a, an appropriate solution is developed which recognizes the hardships that commercial property owners and their tenants are going, are going through and will go through if this uh, increase is passed as is. 21% is a huge increase on any, by any standard. Please you, support us by having an open process. James Dolzaki is our next speaker. After that is um, Frank Gallo and then Jeremy uh, Corselli. Good morning, sir. Hi. Good morning, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, distinguished council members. My name is James Dolzaki. Um, I wear several hats for the city of downtown. I am a property owner. I'm also a resident. I'm a business owner, operator, employer. I also sit on the downtown neighborhood council. Um, I represent my businesses which employ over 150 employees here in downtown. We operate over 100,000 square feet of uh, refrigerated space. Uh, we also own over 160 residential units. And I'm speaking in f favor of item number six uh, for approval for the council to take this up. Um, I feel that if you don't do the proper outreach and you don't involve all the stakeholders of downtown that are involved, I feel that you're sending a very clear message to people like myself who are small or medium-sized business owners. Basically, you're saying that um, the city of Los Angeles no longer welcomes us, and you're, seek you're asking us to go seek greener pastures. Um, again, I don't mind a, a properly vetted rate increase for the DWP, but I think it ought to be transparent. I think there ought to be proper outreach 
And I think you need to go out and solicit all the input from all the stakeholders that are going to be involved. I thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Dozaki. Uh, Frank Gallo, then Jeremy Crisselli, and Larry uh, Rauch are our next speakers. Good morning, City Council. My name is Frank Gallo uh, with Rancho Cold Storage. I'm a business owner downtown, and I'm speaking in favor of, uh, of the move. Uh, Rancho Cold Storage has been located in, in Los Angeles for more than 50 years, employing more than 40 employees and doing business with hundreds of local food distributors in the area. Um, we have been actively working with DWP over the past 10 years and continue to be active in, in their workshops and uh, meeting with them periodically. Uh, we have lost 20% of our business in the last two years due to the down economy. In addition, we were subjected to 27, a 27% power increase within the last year. Uh, with this proposal, an additional 20 to 26 percent will be imposed on us, which is bringing the total to about 50 to 53 percent increase in the past uh, year and a half to two years. Um, with this being said, we cannot pass this on to our customers. Um, our customer base cannot absorb this cost. Uh, currently, we are paying two and a quarter cents more per kilowatt than our competitors in the surrounding areas. Um, with today's economy, we will not be able to pass these costs, as I've mentioned. Not only will we not be able to pass these costs, we'll, have, we'll be forced to begin laying people off or looking to relocate our business. Uh, we are currently about uh, three and a half million cubic feet of cold storage in downtown LA and have been here, um, like I said, the, the original been here, buildings have been here since the 1920s. Um, if it is necessary for green energy, uh, now may not be the time. Um, given the fact that businesses have already suffered economy uh, decline, plus the increases in the utility bills, we don't feel at this point that the, uh, the increase would be advantageous uh, and to us as a business in this city. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, for Jeremy Corselli is next. After that is Larry Roush and Jennifer Murphy. Hi, yeah, I, I, excuse me, I work with uh, Frank, I'm the engineer at Rancho Cold Storage, and, you know, we're all for re, uh, renewable energy, um, and we're looking at solar. We've reduced our uh, consumption by 20%, mainly because we had to, uh, uh, like Frank had said, you know, we just weathered a 27% increase in power with this additional 20%, it's, uh, it's about a 50% increase. Our customers will just go down the street to Vernon, where they're paying eight cents a kilowatt, where we'll be paying 14 cents a kilowatt. We will lose our customer base. We cannot compete, and we are a union house. We are good paying jobs. We are part of local union 630. Uh, we we employ full. Uh, uh, they get our employees have full benefits, uh, a good paying job, and contribute to uh, the economic base of LA. Please, I'm in support of this motion. I fear with this rate increase that this is a final nail in the coffin for the industrial sector in Los Angeles for good paying jobs. So please uh, take a look at this issue and, uh, and, 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 uh, and I'm for uh, motion six. Thanks. Thank you. Larry Roush is next. Uh, Jennifer Murphy and then Joanna Vinnickard. Good, good morning. I am Larry Rauch. I'm the president of Los Angeles Cold Storage. We're a 115-year-old company uh, in, the, uh, in the CCEA district, industrial district. We have 75 uh, employees, union employees, and as Jeremy said at his business, they're good-paying jobs. I'm also vice chairman of the Central City East Association, which represents 863 businesses and 7,200 employees just in the industrial district. And I am also in support of Jan's motion. Uh, it is something that this council needs to take control over. You have a situation where businesses will not be able to afford this. Employees will lose their jobs because uh, we have had significant rate increases uh, from DWP, and this on top of it is going to have a significant effect. Uh, you've, hear, you've heard from people who have tenants from people who are not going to be able to pass it on. We're one of those people who cannot pass it on. We have cut our kilowatt hour usage by 2.7 million kilowatt hours over the last year. 2.7 million kilowatt hours, and this still will cost us 
several hundred thousand dollars, this rate increase. It is not possible for businesses in this area to sustain. It is a important for the city to protect its industrial base. That's what we keep hearing. We want industry, we want to protect our industrial base, and I would suggest to you that this is exactly how not to do it. So we are in support of Jan's motion. You are elected officials. You need to take control of this and make sure that you protect all the stakeholders in the city. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ash. Uh, Jennifer Murphy is next. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Jennifer Murphy. I just wanted to uh, speak in uh, favor of uh, uh, item number six. I know that there are concerns about the cost of the carbon re recapture fee, and I know that there's a lot of anxiety because of the down economy. Um, but I'm less concerned about the $2.41 that it'll cost to pay for the carbon recapture fee. That's less than the cost of one gallon of gas. What I'm concerned about is the severe lack of jobs in the construction industry. I am currently unemployed, and I know how hard it is to pay the bills right now, the Renewable Energy Fund will provide 16,000 jobs that can help me pay my mortgage and support my family. This is something that is critical in the hard times, and it's an investment in our communities and our labor force and the environment. It's all for the price of a gallon of gas. I'm speaking in favor of that, and also... Good morning. Sorry. Just... Can, we get, can we go in order? Is that right? What was your name, sir? We can't yield time, unfortunately, between speakers, so I'll make sure. Do you have a card in? No, they wouldn't accept my card. Okay. Well, let's wait, sir. We have a bunch of folks that are here ahead of Thank time. You. So let me, we can't yield time, unfortunately, but I'll, I'll see what we can do. Joanne Ivanek Garb is our next speaker. Good morning. Yeah. Joanne Ivanek Garb, West Hills Neighborhood Council. I pray that you city council members vote to approve the measure to assert jurisdiction over the DWP commissioner's action to raise the uh, rates. Since we don't have an independent ratepayers advocate yet, and the proposal has not been vetted by the oversight DWP oversight committee or the DWP MOU, it falls to the city council members to protect the interests of the stakeholders. I hear the talk that we need green jobs, but aren't we already paying a surcharge? Didn't Measure B give you a clue as to what the, the public wants? As Mr. T would say, I pity the poor fools who believe that this rate increase is just and fair. Thank you. Thank you. Chris Rose, our next speaker. After that is Walter Moore. Chris Rowe, West Hills Neighborhood Council. I'm speaking for myself. I am disappointed that the LADWP called a special election to pass the ECAF. Again, they have violated the MU by, uh, without vetting it through the neighborhood council system. It was just a year ago that we were here talking about Measure B. In the last year, we have not seen any feasibility studies or costs for the renewable portfolio. The DWP is transferring $200 million to the general fund as excess. That means that you do not have a shortage of money. I've been paying for green power for almost 10 years. My cost for green power on my latest bill is roughly at least $100 a year. I pay 10% a year in general taxes. And um, in December, the GM of the LADWP came before Ian and committee, Council Member Perry and Council Member uh, President Garcetti told Mr. Freeman that the community does not trust the LADWP. We need an independent ratepayers advocate. Placing the ratepayer under the city controller's office is not giving it the independence that the council member Perry implied that the position uh, needed in December. Um, I want to thank my council members, Zion and Smith, for saying no to the ECAF, and thank you to others who have asked for the council to assert its authority over the LADDP commissioner's decision. Um, I, I just want to ask you, please, to uh, look at the ratepayer issue, to think seriously about um, we had projects going out there. Green Path North was killed. The 55 megawatts of solar that was supposed to go in was killed. How can we raise rates when we're not getting anything back with what we've already been paying? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Walter Moore is our next speaker. After that is Vicki uh, Kirschenbaum. And after that is Bob Oetti. Good morning. 
Good morning. My name is Walter Moore. My website is Walter Moore Says. I'm here to commend you, including Council Member Perry, for having the, the good sense to review Villaraigosa's rate proposal. There are three reasons you should reject it. Number one, the DWP already gets more than enough of our money as it is. They made a profit of $356 million last year just on power. They have a profit margin above private companies above Southern California Edison. You need them to justify to you why we should be paying them even more. Reason number two, the public has been misled about the cost of this proposal. It's not $2.50 a month. If you'll re review David Zonheiser's article, you'll see we're talking about a $648 million increase in what the city pays. That's a 24% increase. The result of doing that brings us to reason three is you will kill jobs if you adopt this proposal. Vera goes a $648 million rate increase is the economic equivalent of a neutron bomb. If you set it off, the buildings won't be destroyed, but the jobs will die. You've already taken another good step this year, which was to reduce the tax burden on internet businesses of $3.4 million. You did that so they wouldn't flee the city. If you then now adopt this rate increase, you will have taken 3.4 million steps forward and about 477 million steps backwards. You can't kill off employment more than the city has already. You, you must not do that. Unemployment rate in this city is 14.5 percent. That's way above the national average, way above California. Don't put it even higher. Find the facts and details at waltermoresays.com and I brought a handout for you. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll hand that to one of the Sergeant at Arms and we'll yes, uh, one of the Sergeant at Arms to get that. That would be great. Vicky uh, Christianbaum, then Bob O'Lady, and then Evan Gillespie. Good morning, ma'am. Hi, my name is Vicki Kirschenbaum, and I am asking you to support the LA DWP proposal. The mayor said just a couple of days ago that the majority of ratepayers do want to invest in renewables. Why? Because so much of this city's energy portfolio is coal. Coal is a dirty fuel, coal mining, coal transportation, coal combustion, contribute heavily to asthma, heart disease, cancer, and stroke. And since 44% of LA's electricity is coming from coal burning power plants, especially Inner Mountain in Utah, our city bears responsibility for the health impacts to the communities around those coal plants and also for the millions of tons of CO2 that's emitted by those plants. And CO2 is the major cause of global warming. So why did we invest in coal and why in Inner Mountain? Coal is cheap. But pending regulations on coal combustion pollutants are going to make those costs skyrocket. So I say invest in renewables today, and we're going to be able to save money tomorrow. Thank you very much. Bob O'Leary. After that is Evan Gillespie and Larry Good morning, uh, Council Piles. Good morning. Well, I'm Bob O'Leary. I'm with IBW Local 11. I'm a resident, a ratepayer, and a parent. And I support the rate increase. Council rejection of the DWP board action would not only reject the additional $20 million supplemental tra transfer, it would also nullify the $73 million transfer scheduled to be deposited to the city's general fund. So I ask for your support for green jobs and for working families. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, very much. Appreciate your comments, Evan Gillespie. And then Larry, uh, Larry Piles and John Walsh. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Evan Gillespie. I am representative of the Sierra Club here. Uh, we expect accountability at every step along this process, and today is no different. We fully support uh, the motion today and are glad the Council will take the opportunity to have a long and honest look at the proposal uh, before you and consider all the options and the consequences of the decision before you. Uh, investments made through this plan will be tied to an integrated resource plan, and therefore, uh, along with oversight from the City Controller's Office, will be, uh, should provide sufficient assurance that the investments made by this renewable fund will be spent wisely. The real question we have to ask ourselves today uh, is how do we get into this mess and how do we avoid repeating the same mistakes now and into the future? The PA report is very clear on this point. Uh, the city's dependence on fossil fuels, especially coal and natural gas, are what got us into the debt 
and are going to be the reason why we continue to uh, continue along this path. Uh, according to the PA report, the, co uh, the cost of just transferring coal from the mine to the power plant is going to increase by upwards of $175 million annually by 2014. Uh, then there's also federal and state carbon legislation coming that will be mandated on every single utility in this country. And then the EPA has federal rulings on ozone, coal ash, and mercury coming very soon. Uh, all this means that the days of cheap coal are over. And the sooner we get out of it, the sooner we can do the right thing for ratepayers. Uh, just because rates are going to go up doesn't mean that the bills have to go up. Uh, that's why this plan is so important. By making inv uh, investments in energy efficiency right now, uh, we can do whatever we can to moderate the impact of rising rates on families. By moving quickly from coal to, uh, from coal to clean energy, we can protect ratepayers from what are inevitable uh, but drastic increases in the coming years. But we have the opportunity right now to invest in Los Angeles and not in out-of-state coal companies. We can uh, invest in our city by creating creating green jobs, and stop sending money out of state. We have to act now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Larry Piles. Then John Walsh will follow, and Christy Scarborough. Good morning, morning sir. Uh, I, too, represent a public cold storage facility here in Los Angeles. Uh, we've been in business for about 33 years. Uh, currently, we have two 225 kW solar power systems. DWP recognized that back in 2003. Uh, we have not seen any type of rate reduction with those two systems. Actually, I'm actually being billed because I have them. Uh, I don't think that's fair, and I think that should be recognized. As far as DWP wanting to do another rate increase, I concur with my colleagues. You're going, to, you're going to put us out of business. We've already looked at alternatives going to Vernon. If that's what we need to do, we may, we may have to take that option. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, John Walsh, and then Chrissy Scarborough, and then Shane Cutting. John Walsh blogging at Hollywood Highlands, H-I-G-H-L-A-N-D-S dot org. 37,000 visitors a week. Ladies and gentlemen, you know, in occupied France, when the Nazis were in there, the right and the left formed an alliance, an underground, to fight the people who were occupying. And that's why we of the left support the businessmen. We support your businesses. We work at your businesses. We want to work together to keep these rates down so you can employ us. I'm telling you right now what has happened is simple. The mayor of this city, Antonio Villaragosa, has five votes on the DWP board. It's like five pimples on his backside. They're about as independent. Now you up here are responding to our pressure by taking the power away from the mayor, which is a wonderful idea. The mayor was on NPR talking to all the white people of America, the only people who listen to NPR radio, white people, and saying yesterday, we need more taxes in LA for jobs. I want you to know that there was a leader that created enormous number of jobs in the barbed wire industry. And his name was Adolf Hitler, and he built camps, concentration camps, and all the people in the barbed wire industry loved him. Jobs, jobs, jobs. You know, some of us have jobs, and we won't be able to pay our rate hike. We will not be able to. So this is what I'm telling you right now. HollywoodHighlands.org, when you're bored with the meeting, go to us while you're watching. I want you to take this rate hack, Mr. Mayor, out there in Santa Monica, at the LA Marathon in Santa Monica. Take this rate high and shove it you know where, Mr. Mayor. Chrissy Scarborough is our next speaker. Shane Cutting after that, and Gary Tobin. Hi. My name is Chrissy Scarborough. I live in North Hollywood and I'm a rate payer also and I work for the Sierra Club as a grassroots organizer 
Every day, this city powers itself by burning 12,000 tons of coal, releasing toxic mercury, arsenic, lead, nitrous oxide, and sulfur dioxide into the air. We export our jobs, money, and pollution to out-of-state coal companies. This city must show true leadership, or we will simply continue with the status quo, buying dirty coal, polluting Navajo and Hopi land where our coal is mined and burned, and using over 18 billion gallons of water a year to cool those two coal plants. If this city claims it wants to be green, well, it's time for leadership. This report shows clearly that the largest portion of this rate increase goes to polluting fossil fuels, with 44% of Los Angeles' energy coming from a dirty 19th century fuel source, coal. Our city is in a dangerous position where the whims of an unpredictable fossil fuel market threaten to increase our utility bills. Over the last few months, this city has been waking up to the fact that we're powered by coal. We have done outreach to community groups, campuses, and in public spaces. We've gathered over 3,000 signatures in support of this effort. We've talked to democratic clubs, faith organizations, and student governments. And the overwhelming response is shock that this green city is powered by coal. And let's make it clear that the consequences of climate change will affect the most vulnerable here in Los Angeles. Those people who can least afford an increase will be forced year after year to pay the price of coal-fired energy with increased temperatures, fires, and drought. Not to mention paying for the volatility of fossil fuel markets. We know what the consequences of inaction will be for the people of Los Angeles. Deadly summer heat waves, wildfire frequency, and intensity due to climate change and polluted air and water across the southwest. It's time to make the necessary investments that will protect ratepayers from the increased prices associated with our coal-fired power plants and create green jobs here in LA now. It's time for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Shane Cutting is our next speaker. And then Gary Tobin. After Mr. Tobin will be Jim Clark. Hello, my name Hello, my name is Shane Cutting, and today I'm representing California Interfaith Power and Light, and I thank you for your time. We work with 500 congregations of all faiths, including seven large congregations in the city of Los Angeles, to address global warming with energy efficiency, sustainable energies, and policy advocacy. California is but one state affiliated of the 31 state strong National Interfaith Power and Light movement, which works with some 10,000 congregations nationwide. California Interfaith Power and Light supports the establishment of a renewable energy trust fund. We are committed to ensuring that Mayor Villaraigosa's plan of having LADWP be coal-free by 2020 become a reality. The ironic thing is, energy prices will continue to rise no matter what. And the issue is that is not raised is that the people of Los Angeles are already paying the high cost for dirty fossil energy. These costs are reflected in higher health care expenses due to hospitalizations, asthma, and other respiratory illnesses from poor air quality, as well as lost work days and even premature deaths. And it is often the folks who are in the most economically disadvantaged communities that are affected. The Renewable Energy Trust Fund will not only approach the health care issue for the people of Los Angeles in the coming years, this trust fund is, the esti is estimated to create 18,000 new jobs and stimulate local economic development. This trust fund is not just about renewable energy. It's about environmental and economic justice, putting people to work and empowering the city of Los Angeles to become a leader in the field of renewable energy. All major faith traditions honor the principle of environmental stewardship. This principle is not something ethereal or disconnected to the real world. On the contrary, environmental stewardship, especially in this day and age, includes job creation, clean air and water, and economic and environmental justice. The creation of the Renewable Energy Trust Fund is exactly the right thing we need for all those things. And it will ensure the viability of health and the people of Los Angeles well into the future. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, Gary Tobin is our next speaker. After that is Jim Clark and then Kim Kraft. President Garcetti and members of the council. I'm Gary Tobin. I'm president and CEO of the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce. And I'm here today to urge your support for this motion, which will provide more time for businesses to work together with DWP and members of the council on to reduce the negative impact that this rate increase will have on our economy and jobs. Two weeks ago, the state of California released its latest employment numbers, and they showed that Los Angeles County had lost 526,000 jobs since the start of this recession. And 510,000 of those jobs were working families in the private sector. 
the businesses of Los Angeles are hurting. You've heard it here today. They have no way of passing these utility rate increases onto their customers. As a result, they will be forced to make yet one more decision about reducing their workforce in order to balance their budget and stay in business. We certainly understand the importance of DWP balancing its budget and paying for the higher cost of renewable energy. But for government to do this at the expense of more lost jobs in business is not in the best interest of our economy nor the citizens of Los Angeles. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tobin. Uh, Jim Clark is our next speaker, then Kim Kraft after Mr. Kraft is Kent Smith. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the City Council. Thank you, Jan Perry, for this motion. Uh, I'm Jim Clark with the Apartment Association of Greater Los Angeles. We represent approximately 25,000 members and represent 320,000 apartment units in the City of Los Angeles. You've heard from the business community. Let's talk about housing. Obviously, you know that most of our buildings are subject to rent control. Right now, we get a 4% increase. Come July 1st, we'll probably get a 3% increase. And any time something like this happens, 22% increase, it's another nail in the coffin for affordable housing providers in this city. It is not offset by what we can get in a, in a rent increase. 22, 3. Doesn't pencil out. We pay for the common area electricity. Our renters are going to get hit by this as well, but we pay for the common area electricity, we're going to get hit big. I want to talk to you about green jobs, because all these folks are interested in jobs. We support green jobs. If you gave us a 100% capital improvement pass-through to do energy efficient retrofitting on our buildings, like solar panels, like uh, window retrofits, like door retrofits, we'd do it. But we don't have that ability right now. It doesn't pencil out. Please support this motion. Take control of what the DWP has proposed. Let's iron it out. Let's, let's put some other stuff into this and, and uh, make it work for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Kim Kraft is next. Uh, Kent Smith will follow him. And after Mr. Smith is Randy Britt. Thank you, Chair, Council Members. Kim Kraft, Assistant Business Manager, Local 11 International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. We support sustainability, financial feasibility, and responsibility. But we also believe that it costs ten times to incarcerate what it does to educate or create jobs. We need to look at this opportunity. We need to bring the economies of scale to Los Angeles through a renewable package to create not only construction jobs, but to bring manufacturing to L.A. as well. So we support the rate increase. We need to look at putting the nearly 20% of our members who are out of work back to work and create new jobs for the youth of this community. Roosevelt knew it was no secret. The way to, to work your way out of a recession is through jobs and the creation of jobs. We have the opportunity here. We're not opposed to the city council being responsible and looking towards the long-term sustainability of the city of L.A., but we need to focus, as many of the speakers have talked about here, on bringing that work to L.A. We have an opportunity. We need to capitalize on it, and we are here to hope, ask for your support, and all the members here support that issue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate your comments. Ken Smith is our next speaker. After Mr. Smith is Randy Britt and then Ryan Wiggins. Good morning, council members. My name is Kent Smith. I'm the executive director of the LA Fashion District Bid. We represent over 950 property owners and 4,000 businesses in downtown LA. Our board is, una is unanimously opposed to this 21% increase in power rates, and we are definitely in support of council taking jurisdiction over DWP and the proposed rate increase. Many of our businesses have already taken full advantage of DWP's energy conservation programs. The increase we estimate translates into $11,700,000 annually for the businesses and properties in the fashion district. We are responsible for over 64,000 jobs in this city, according to LAEDC. The DWP rate increase puts every one of those 664,000 jobs in jeopardy. Businesses will have no choice in this difficult economy. They'll have to cut their costs and lay off more staff to accommodate the increase. Please take jurisdiction over this rate increase, 
create a transparent process for all the stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Randy Britt, then Ryan Wiggins, and Gary Parker will follow. Mr. Wiggins. Good morning, Council Members. My name is Randy Britt. I'm the Director of Sustainability Initiatives for the Los Angeles Unified School District. I've been asked by our Superintendent Ramon Cortinas to read a letter to you, and I will present it to you afterwards. Dear Council Members, last week the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power Board of Commissioners approved the energy cost adjustment factor rate increases, which if instituted will have a significant impact on LAUSD. The district is struggling to stay above water. The budget crisis has forced us to reduce central and school site staff, including teachers, and to reduce programs and classroom resources to levels not seen in decades. Educating our students is the single most important mission of LAUSD. However, the constant cuts and increase, increases coming at us from every angle is making our ability to provide the resources our students need to succeed quite challenging. I am pleased that the City Council will be taking up an item at its Council meeting today that, if approved, will enable the City Council to exercise its authority to review and approve the LADWP Board of Commissioners' recently approved ECAF increase. I respectfully request that you, members of the City Council of the Great City of Los Angeles, approve this motion and exercise your authority to take this important item up for the City Council in action. Before I go any further, I'd like to clarify something. I and the entire district are supportive of investing in solar energy. In fact, the district has already 1.2 megawatts of renewable energy installed and in operation with another 3.7 at seven sites in progress and another 17.5 megawatts at 90 sites anticipated to be brought to the Board of Education for action in April. One of my concerns lies with the speed with which the ECAF increases are being proposed and acted upon, the lack of public discussion, the uncertainty surrounding what this increase will actually fund, and whether this is just the beginning of significant increases to come. LAUSD is the single largest user of LADWP services with approximately 433 million kilowatt hours annually to educate approximately 1 million K-12 adult and career education and early childhood education students. If exercise, this increase which has announced a prequel to a 2% increase in ECAF would result in an $8.7 million increase to LAUSD's utility budget. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Ryan Wiggins. Gary Parker will follow him. And then after that is uh, Kathy Seal. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Ryan Wiggins. I'm the campaign director with Indoil. Um, I would just like to go ahead and express support for the Council's action here. Uh, we not only ask for, we demand a very transparent process here. We believe that no one should bear disproportionate costs. But really for us, it's a question of cost versus investments. The costs here are, for me, represent coal. Coal, we've invested in for a long time. It's no one's fault. That was the technology that was available here. It's not the ratepayers' fault. It's not the City Council's fault. It's not LADDB's fault. But the reality is we have to deal with the problems that is born. Those problems are health problems, global warming, and we ex actually export our problems out of state. The investment is an investment in renewable energy. It's a sustainable, it's a sustainable um, way to go. It comes with a price tag, but the reality is we'll give us sustainable prices, and it is going to accrue to certain businesses and certain residents. But we can offset those costs to those businesses and those residents through an aggressive energy efficiency program. It's a rate hike, but it doesn't necessarily mean that costs will have to increase. Um, one other thing I would like to ask a favor of the council before I finish my comments is that as we, we have two minutes up here to actually give our viewpoint, the council can actually have its questions first and the PA consulting her first, then we have an opportunity to come up and express our opinions on what you've said. But we, and, then, and then you can respond. We get one chance up here for two minutes to actually address you. And we would like to have the opportunity to hear what you want to say, to hear what the consulting group wants to say, and then be able to and have you respond to what we are able to say as well. We feel that's representative because we have no chance to respond to what you say. So thank you very much. Thank you. And just as a point of information, uh, Ms. Perry's committee will be having hearings, so you'll have a second bite there and as, as much as a third bite when it comes back to council as well to continue that dialogue. Gary Parker is our next speaker, then Kathy Seal, and then Monique Lopez. Good morning. My name is Gary Parker. I represent IBW Local 11. I live in the Valley, and I'm a DWP uh, tax uh, rate payer. I came here to talk about the impact of the carbon recapture fee. First of all, it encourages conservation and energy efficiency. Second, it promotes the use of renewable energy at an economy of scale that will bring some of the manufacturing to Los Angeles. For the, cup, for the cost of a cup of coffee, coffee on the low end, and on the high end, a gallon of gas, we could provide 18,000 
desperately needed jobs to our city. The difference between paying for carbon-based fuels and using renewables are many. Renewables are cleaner for the environment. They provide more jobs per dollar spent. They're responsible for creating new industry. They save money, and finally, they pay for themselves in a few years. You all are not just spending money. You're making an investment in the air that we breathe, the jobs for the communities that we live in, and it will pay for itself. We need your leadership on this issue, and I humbly ask for you to support the CRF and the ECAF. There is no other issue that my organization sees fit and is important to vote on. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you for your work as well. Kathy Seal. Then uh, Monique Lopez, and then we'll go to Donna Perriman in Van Nuys. Good morning. Hi. Um, my name is Kathy Seal. I'm a volunteer with Sierra Club, and I pay that DWP bill every other month. I'm here to speak in favor of the ECAF, otherwise known as the Renewable Energy Trust Fund. Yes, this must be transparent, financially sound, create job opportunities, and increase our RPS. But I'd like to speak in particular to the fact that this ECAF includes an efficiency program. This efficiency program can keep the bills down. None of us want to pay more money for our energy. This need not happen because this proposal includes efficiency measures, which will keep the bills down as well as employing people to put to, in green jobs to help people employ efficiency measures in their home. It's time for Los Angeles to take responsibility. We get 44% of our energy from dirty, filthy coal, which is contributing to global warming. Our city is larger than many countries, and as such, we need to take responsibility for the fact that global warming is an impending ecological catastrophe. What are we doing to help stop this? We can do something very big right now by taking responsibility for these coal emissions and stopping them. We don't have to do this. We can transform our system and um, use renewable energy instead. I urge this council and the council president to take responsibility now to avert this impending ecological catastrophe. Thank you. Thank you. Monique Lopez is next. Monique Lopez with the Coalition for Clean Air. Thank you for this opportunity to speak before you. Uh, we are pleased that the City Council is taking this issue very seriously and taking a deep look into this. Um, let, let it be noted on the record that dirty fuels like coal are responsible for well more than the majority of the energy cost adjustment factor um, that is being proposed uh, to increase. Uh, by making an investment in, in um, upfront investment in clean energy now, the DWP can save rate pairs, avoidable and drastic cost increases in the future. We need to also keep in mind pending state and federal uh, carbon legislation that will impact uh, the future of rates at the DWP. And accountable, and, and I absolutely agree with uh, Councilwoman Perry when she says we need a transparent and fiscally sound process. And we see that as, number one, it is essential that investments in renewable energy and energy efficiency are tied to a long-term investment plan. The utility report backs annually on how the, its budgets um, on how its budget supports a long-term integrated resource plan and that there is an open and public process. Number two, the Renewable Energy Investment Fund and fossil fuel purchases need to be audited by the City Controller's Office. These audits need to include how incremental investments connect to long-term strategy and resource plan of the utility. And number three, it is imperative that annual investments linked to the IRP consider strategic options in terms of resource mixes and resource locations, infrastructure needs, t challenges, and a contingency plan. Investing in renewable energy today in order to be coal free by 2020 is an imperative goal for LADWP customers and an anyone concerned about the impacts of a change in climate. As a result, we believe that, that investing in renewable energy today 
will save us in the future. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll go to Van Eyes and Donna Perriman uh, will be our next speaker. After that, we'll come back here and Jack Humperville and um, Matt Dowd will be our two speakers following Ms. Perriman. And I believe this will cost a lot more than what you say. How can you ask increases when the city employees who get 35000 have to work 30, 30 years while you work only 12 years? How can we afford this increase? How can the rest of us afford the DWP 20% increase? We can't afford huge increases. People are not getting raises and losing money on furloughs. How can these people afford to pay a huge increase? Yes, it's okay if we go green. That sounds good. No coal. If we raise the colas on the next contract with the city employees. City employees should get their raises because the DWP got their raise and they want to raise their rates. We, they, people can't afford to uh, pay these rates unless they get extra money. That's why we need, they need the cost of living. No deferring any more raises, no furloughs because we because uh, they want to raise the DWP. It's not possible for homes to sustain. People worry about businesses. What about homes? What about people who... Uh, and I don't believe that all these things are going to be done. I don't believe you, the transparency is going to be there. Paul Washington should take a 50% cut and have to work longer than the 12 years to get any retirement. People shouldn't get any retirement in 12 years. I have an idea. Let's have the CRA fund this project because they're taking all of the money from the... Uh, Tax incre uh, general fund or tax increment money, and that's why now we're having this problem and why we have to have so, uh, green projects. Yes, the green projects are good. Uh, I like to be able to get away from coal if we could um, get raises to the people, especially the city employees, and I wouldn't mind if all the other rest of the some people can be able to get raises, but right now we have to worry much that the city employees, because they gave so much to us. Uh, no DWP raises. People can't afford it. Simple as that. It's no brainer, folks. Matt Dowd. Matt Dowd. Matt Dowd. Chuck Ray. Good morning, thank you. Uh, my name is Chuck Ray. I'm from Mar Vista, and I'm also the vice chairman of the uh, Neighborhood Council's Department of Water and Power MOU Oversight Committee. It's a long name. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm here just to speak for myself because this is being rushed so fat, so rapidly that neither the Mar Vista Community Council that serves my area nor the uh, MOU committee have had the time to uh, properly vet the information that's uh, going on. In fact, at Thursday's meeting uh, of the special, the special meeting of the Board of Governors, the Board of Governors of the DWP, we didn't even see the motions they were passing on. We just had little summaries. As a computer programmer, I'm a little annoyed by this because I'm, a computer programmer knows all about process. I see here a broken process. And I think on that point alone, it's imperative that the council take jurisdiction over what the DWP's board has done because that process is one that could be attacked and everything they've done could be overturned simply on process. Now, one of the processes that they did not follow was the MOU itself. At the meeting, the uh, chairman of the board asked the city attorney, uh, was it true that the MOU requires that they give 90-day notice to rate for rate increases in one year or 128 days if they're long-term rate increases? And he acknowledged that was true. And they proceeded to go ahead and pass the motion that you're now trying to take jurisdiction over. So I think on process alone, the, you should go ahead and take jurisdiction. I've heard a lot about the other issues. Give us time to get those other issues, to give us time to read this report that obviously was no part of the board meeting last Thursday. That Thank, you. Thank you, sir. Glenn Berryhill. Good morning, Council. I'm Glenn Berryhill. I'm the Western Region Vice President of Property Management for Thomas Properties Group. 
We represent approximately 3 million square feet of commercial office space in Los Angeles, housing nearly 100 businesses. Uh, we support uh, the council uh, motion to assert jurisdiction of the LADWP board action on March 18th. <laughs> Uh, we also support sustainability and energy efficiency. We've invested over $15 million over the past five years in energy saving capital projects. That's resulted in a consumption reduction uh, in, at our properties of uh, nearly 25%. However, we're concerned that the additional uh, consumption reduction necessary to, uh, uh, to break even on the 22.5% rate increase uh, is not likely achievable. Uh, and will result in direct additional cost to businesses in this difficult economic environment. The proposed rate increase will have a direct economic impact in businesses uh, in, uh, that we represent of over $1.6 million. Uh, property, owners continually, uh, property owners and city businesses uh, uh, will direct, be directly impacted uh, with respect to job creation in the city of Los Angeles. Uh, business owners continuously evaluate their decision to operate in this city. They may, in fact, choose to move their businesses elsewhere, uh, along with the jobs that they uh, create. For businesses that do choose to stay in Los Angeles, their executives will be forced to look at the bottom line and make employment decisions based on their ability to pay. Um, this may potentially add to the city's un uh, current unemployment rate. Thomas Properties Group is urging the council to further evaluate the overall impact of the rate increase on businesses and its effects on job creation in both the public and private sector. We assert that jobs to be created in sustainability are not more important than current jobs that need to be preserved and supported now. We urge the Council and DWP to find a balance between the proposed rate increase in light of the current economic environment and see if there's a, uh, the rate increase can be scaled back. Thank you. Shamari Davis. Good morning, council members. My name is Shamari Davidson from IBW Local 11. Um, I'm concerned about the cost of inaction of limiting carbon emissions, particularly the impact on the city's general fund. Under AB 32, an executive order by Governor Schwarzenegger, the city of Los Angeles will be on the hook for about $634 million in carbon fines in 2012 if we don't take immediate action to wean the DWP of its over-dependence on fossil fuels. Establishing a renewable and energy efficiency trust fund now is absolutely essential because we will be able to invest in projects to reduce our carbon emissions and create good jobs. Doing this now minimizes the city's contribution to the inevitable state-mandated carbine funds. Thank you. Thank you. Gus Corona. Gus Corona. Good morning, Council. My name is Gus Corona, Senior Bus Assistant Business Manager for IBW Local 18. And we stand here in support, along with our sisters and brothers of IBW Local 11, in support of the modification to the ECAF. The LADWP, the largest publicly owned utility, has an obligation and an opportunity to lead this city to cleaner air and to green jobs. Those are jobs of the future, jobs such as solar and energy efficiency. You've heard from ratepayers, church groups, environmental groups and labor unions and we all stand here and ask you to move quickly on this modification and let's clean the air and create jobs here in the city of Los Angeles. Thank you. Thank you. Jack Humperville. I'm sorry Jack I didn't see that you were the next up and we switched positions that's what happened. I won't take it personally. It's not personal. Thank you. My name is Jack Humphreyville. I'm from the Greater Wilshire Neighborhood Council. I'm the chair of the DWP committee, and I actually have a day job over at the Recycler Classifieds, Recycler.com. We employ about 600 people. This is not, I'm not here to talk about the $700 million, 20% increase. I'm here to talk about transparency, credibility, and the role of the city council in the, in the charter. 
Transparency is obviously something very important here. LAUSD, a $60 million customer, endorses it. PA Consulting put forth a very revealing report that endorsed transparency also. If there's any one reason why we need an independent ratepayers advocate, it's situations like this. We're hearing all sorts of scare tactics about why, 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 the, why the city council should not exert control here. But when they start raising these scare tactics, it makes me wonder, what is going on at DWP? Last year, DWP had an operating profit of $940 million. They take 10%. 10% for the city utility tax, 8% for the transfer tax. They should be setting that aside. If they can't pay it, who's plundering DWP? What is the mayor, his board of directors, and his two politically appointed people doing to DWP's money? Are they overcommitting? All this is starting to sound a little bit like Measure B. A rush to judgment, blank checks, deceptions, no financials, lots of promises. It starts, it's, it, to use Laura Chick's word, it really starting to stink. Or to start to, or use the LA Times, there's a whiff of deception. And I think it's a pretty big whiff of deception. I urge the city council to assert control over this, to have great here, to have open and transparent hearings based on the PA consulting report, a report that our, our light bulb board of commissioners of the DWP did not even discuss at their recent meeting. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Carol Schatz? You're going to pass, Carol? Pass. Okay. And our final speaker on this matter is Alice Druffell. Druffell? Not here. Okay. That's it for our public speakers on this matter. We will now go to uh, Council Member Jan Perry. Thanks, Mr. Uh, Assistant Pro Tem. And I'd like to ask uh, the members of PA Consulting to come to the middle table. And uh, for the record, if you would introduce yourselves by name. I'm Andrew Ray. I'm a partner with PA Consulting and the head of our pull the microphone closer. I'm Andrew Ray. I'm a partner with PA Consulting, the head of our Los Angeles office, and led the uh, effort on behalf of the city council to look at the DWP's ECAF proposal. I'm uh, Dr. Jonathan Jacobs, PA Consulting. And Mark Hagan with PA Consulting. Okay, what I'd like for you to do, in addition to pulling the mic closer, <laughs> is... Uh, Give us uh, the key components of your review and the depth to which you reviewed them, your key findings and recommendations, rationale, and then there seems to be some confusion about actual recommendations, whether or not you're recommending a full 2.7 per kilowatt increase over four quarters, or if it is actually 0.8 cent per kilowatt hour by April the 1st, and then do that within the context of reevaluating ECAF objectives and um, how your recommendations address the concerns of the bond rating agencies. Okay. Thank you. We based our analysis, first of all, on the department's five-year financial plan, which ends in 2014. So we verified all the calculations and assumptions made for each ECAF component. This plan assumes the department will reach a 20% level of renewable energy in 2010 and maintain it for the next five years. The department's five-year plan also assumes no reduction in coal usage over the time period of the study. So any cost and rate increases mentioned in our report do not include the additional cost of removing coal from the DWP's portfolio. We've applied a number of sensitivities to the department's plan to understand how real-world conditions, such as changes in commodity prices, outage in units, and other things that happen in the everyday world, would affect the department's financial results. Our specific recommendations are to preserve the financial health of the department and to begin a process of creating greater transparency that will help avoid future financial issues similar to those facing the department today, we recommend the council undertake the following coordinated set of actions. 
First, we believe an immediate increase in the ECAF rate of 0.8 cents per kilowatt hour, which will represent a 6% increase in rates for most customers, should be granted as soon as possible. Second, and equally important, we believe the current ECAF should be unbundled into multiple elements, separating short-term market-driven elements from predictable costs associated with longer-term commitments. This will increase transparency and allow the Council and ratepayers to fully understand the cost of commitments being made under the Department's RPS and energy efficiency programs. Separating those costs from other market-based factors that may cause rates to go up or down. This unbundling should be carefully designed to ensure changes are revenue neutral, promote transparency, and comply with all of the Department's legal and accounting obligations. We believe getting this right is absolutely critical not only for managing the current, com current commitments of reaching 20% RPS, but for understanding and managing the cost of additional commitments for either higher re renewable usage or lower coal usage, or the costs of complying with AB 32. Further increases in the ECAF rate components should be, su should be subject to the successful completion of, of this unbundling. We believe there are significant opportunities to mitigate the size of the rate increase below the 2.7 cents that's currently on the table. And so therefore we believe further study is needed to do that. We also believe that the goals of the department's rate restructuring proposal need to be further evaluated. That's the actual rate design that would be implemented to um, put the 2.7 cents in effect if it's approved. This restructure would have a very significant impact on Tier 2 and Tier 3 customers, and the current rate proposal does not address many of the issues raised by Council of, of concerns associated with an ECAF increase. The goals of, a ba of base rate restructuring should be considered as part of a full review of the Department's rates, including both the ECAF restructuring and any required updates to base rates. We wanted to clarify what appears to be a misunderstanding. The DWP board action of last week um, has been described as similar or virtually identical to the PA recommendations. It's in fact very, very different. Um, and I think council may want the time to look at exactly how they are different. It's different in terms of transparency and it's different in terms of the sheer amount of the rate, rate increase itself. So just to reiterate, our recommendations are 0.8 cents now a complete reconstruction of the ECAF and um, a review, uh, so not granting the proposed rate treatment that's in, uh, that was originally proposed by the department at this time. So our specific recommendations are 0.8 cents increase as soon as possible. So all further increases subject to a successful reconstitution of the ECAF and a complete review of the proposed rate treatment um, by the department. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Garcetti. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and, and thank you, uh, Chairman Perry, Chairwoman Perry, for our um, motion that was before us. Um, I was happy to be a co-presenter of this, and I know there was such eagerness in this council that for a moment more than eight members, which we can under the Brown Act, uh, signed on to it. And we have seven members, and I know we have at least ten votes today to assert jurisdiction. But let me start at a different place, because today is a really happy day. Um, to see and to hear this debate, for all of you who haven't been coming to city council meetings for nine years, and I know there's a couple of you out there, but God bless you, most of you don't have to. For nine years, if we cut back to where we were nine years ago, this was a very lonely place to say a lot of the things that almost everybody is saying now. Um, I remember when Alex Padilla and I, there were, I think, five of us on this council that were there that day in 2002, when our then CLA, was a great guy, and we've named an auditorium after him across the street, Ron Deaton, was sure he had the votes to move forward on Mojave, um, a plant uh, that we had that was a coal plant uh, that was kind of business as usual. It was going to be a rubber stamp here in the city council, and Alex Padilla and I turned to each other and we said, we want to get away from coal. Shouldn't we do that? And Ron Deaton kind of laughed at us and said, I've already got the votes. And lo and behold, we took that vote and we had more than eight votes 
to actually sell off half of our stake there, and we said put that into renewables. That was in 2002. That was at a time when the city was ahead of our policymakers, with all due respect, our department, our workers, most of us, because people were signing up for green power before they even knew specifically what the program was. And I said, I think, in 2003, that the ratepayers who have shown their commitment to the environment by signing up in record numbers need a much bigger payoff from this program where they live. I could still say that today. We have great workers at DWP. We have, I think, a great council and mayor who are committed the greenest in both places that we've ever seen. What we need is a plan. And the transparency and accountability that we're having here today is the result of the council saying last year we won't just rubber stamp a rate increase because we want not only clean energy, we want reliable and affordable energy. We don't have to choose one or two of those three. We can have all three of them. One speaker mentioned that the city is just waking up to discovering that we're on coal. I think the city has known for a decade that, and it's one of the wonderful things about living in Los Angeles. We have a union that is one of the greenest unions now, and you all know who have been leaders inside that union. That wasn't always the union line. It wasn't always the council line. We've all made a transformation because we're understanding that and getting that. But what we need now is vision and implementation. We've made some great steps, but we've made a number of missteps, which is why we're also here. I don't want us buying wind energy that somebody else owns in Wyoming when our workers here and our company here, which gives a dividend to our people, not to private rate uh, holders, or sorry, stockholders, but gives it to us each year in the form of a transfer to keep services and all city employees providing the things that we need for a great city. I want to see that here, and that's part of why we had frustration in the past, because people said goals, and then the lazy way was to go buy it in the marketplace and give those jobs to another state. We have a lot of myths out there that this is, for instance, some people say this is nothing than a raise for overpaid workers. That's a lie. Some people have said we need to do this or we're going bankrupt. We don't respond well to a gun to our heads. Others who have said this is all going towards green energy. Well, part of it does, but I think if you read the PA Consulting, then this is about more than just clean energy. It's also about making sure that we have a financially strong utility. So the purpose of this process, and the reason why I've supported this and I'm voting to assert jurisdiction, is to make sure that people do know that, that that dialogue that was asked for can occur, that we move forward green. It isn't just the mayor or the council. We've both adopted these goals, but we want to see a department that adopts the goals in the best way. A gun to our head, some of the language that we received in a briefing is clumsy and condescending. Don't tell us that the quickest way that we're going to go bankrupt is to turn this away. Send it back and get it back with what PA Consulting has asked us to do, which is the exact report that we asked for. Then maybe we'll vote for the point eight now and give good analysis before we do the next point eight and the next point eight, because the people deserve that, our workers deserve that, the environmental community deserves that, and certainly our ratepayers deserve that too. Thank you. Mr. Garcia, I commend you on that all in less than three minutes. Mr. Cardenas. The, the, what the DWP board did, the actions that they took, some people are trying to say, what's well, all about the same thing as the PA report recommendations? You just said that they're not necessarily the same. One of the components is the same, is the 0.8 cents per kilowatt increase one time, the first increase. That's, that's similar to what DWP would like to do and also what you recommended to the city council in your report. that. Uh, that it seems to be agreeable and something that makes sense and something that would hinder negative things happening like bond ratings being affected, et cetera, correct? That's basically correct, yes. Okay. Now, beyond that first quarter increase, that's where it really starts to differ, correct? Yes. Okay. Now, did the Department of Water and Power, did they take a vote separate on that 0.8 cents per kilowatt increase one time and then the rest of the matters on a separate vote? Or did they do it in a way where now we're forced to either reject that 0.8 cents per kilowatt hour inclusive of all the other matters that they voted on? I can't answer that. I think the department would have to answer that. Too. Okay. So the department, can you come forward? Somebody from the department.
Jeff Peltolo, CFO for DWP. Yeah, there were two separate actions. One was to increase the cap to 0.8 cents and creation of the trust fund. And the second action was the actual um, administrative calculation of the energy cost adjustment factor. Now, the first item that you just described, that is a 0.8 cents per quarter going forward for several quarters, or is that a 0.8 cents one-time increase? It, it is the increase of the cap, so it is not actually an increase of the ECAF by itself. The second action, which is really governed, and now I'm getting into the legal, I'll probably ask legal to come up, but that second action is the calculation per that being approved. So if it is not approved, they would be subject to what it was before, which is 0.1. And this is all because in the existing ordinance that was in 2006, I believe, allowed the board to adjust the cap uh, pursuant to financial needs. So basically what you're t trying to describe to us is that there really was no way for the board to bifurcate the various issues and to isolate that one time 0.8 cents per kilowatt increase. It's right. They can only increase the cap 2.8, and then every quarter the board will take action with what that energy cost adjustment, and obviously PA has made recommendations to reconstitute, which would require an ordinance. And Councilman Cardenas, the, the other um, key difference in the 0.8, the way the board passed it, was they also tied it to the creation of the trust fund, so they're linked in the same motion where we would not recommend that. Mm -hmm. So you would not recommend that? No. Okay. And then also, um, why is it that the Department of Water and Power Board voted on 3-18-2010 and not the week before or the week before that? Why was it agenda so late, so close to April 1st? Because the April 1st seems to be the date that was referred to, I think, by, I don't want to misquote our president, that, that are basically saying that we don't like a gun put to our head. Why was it that it took until March 18th that that item was agendized and now it seems like the sky is going to fall if the council gets engaged and actually asserts jurisdiction? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, CEO of DWP. Uh, there was lack of quorum. We didn't have uh, enough board members in town to have a board meeting the week before that. I'm sorry, you got to speak a little louder. What? Uh, we, uh, there was a lack of quorum, so we didn't have enough board members in town to attend the board meeting the week before. Well, you just answered to the wrong councilman the wrong answer. Because I'll tell you this, when I rejected and took jurisdiction over a board action at the Department of Water and Power, they had an emergency board meeting very quickly because they had the will to do so. And also, one of the board members at that time could not make it to the meeting. So what they did to comply with the Brown Act is they went ahead and posted the board meeting at that person's workplace so that they could actually be present on a speakerphone at that meeting and get a quorum. So that that is a bad answer because when the Department of Water and Power wants to, they get things done very quickly. And when they don't want to, they play games like this. I've seen it, and thank God the last time they played those games, we rejected it last time as well. Mr. Zion is our next speaker. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I want to thank the DWP workers for uh, all you do for the people of LA, power, water, etc. So you do a great job with that. 40% by 2020, uh, I asked the consultants, how many green jobs have been created by the Department of Water and Power to date? If you know that. We don't know. Okay. Uh, water and Power representative here, how many green jobs have been created within the department? I can see a whole row of folks that maybe want to answer, maybe don't want to answer. How many green jobs to this date has Water and Power created? Lorraine Paskett, Department of Water and Power. Council member, I don't have the number with me. I can get it for you. I think we need possible. to reflect, since we're talking about renewable, we need to discuss what the Water and Power Department has done to this date. So I'm voting 245 to send this to the committee, Ms. Perry's committee. Uh, I, I don't support the increase. I don't think it's justified, number one. Number two, if we're going to talk about renewable, we need to see what the department has done to this state. So if you can please have that for that next meeting. We will get you both energy efficiency and renewable job numbers. Thank you. Appreciate that. You're welcome. The, uh, you drive down any street in Los Angeles, you see for lease signs. You see foreclosures on many properties. So I feel for the business folks, also for the residential. Uh, the transfer of money from the Department of Water and Power to the city's general fund. And with the statement 
The council rejection of the Water and Power Board action would be the most immediate and direct route to bankruptcy that the city could pursue. Do you agree with that as the consultant? I'm not qualified to speak to the city's total uh, financial health, so um, probably best that someone from the city treasurer office answer that question. Did you look at the financial aspect of the Department of Water Power? Oh, yes, absolutely, of DWP. Are they stable? So DWP today is, is stable. They were Their bond rating was just reaffirmed last week by Fitch. Um, based on probably what they anticipate coming forward, um, we believe that the department, you know, has sufficient cash to meet its requirements over the life of, of this review. Um, going forward, if they incur all of the costs in their plan and all of the increases, they would be in significant financial distress. But are they in distress today? No. Okay. And that's at the point zero eight. If the would the point with the point zero eight increase. Um, this quarter, I think that that will be adequate for the meantime. But that's not what's being proposed by the Department of Water and Power Commission. Right. As, as I said, we support the recommendations that we've made. Um, we, do, we think they're significantly different than what the DWP board has put forward. And w will this reduce the coal use? With this point zero eight, will this re have an impact on the coal use? Uh, it, there's no coal reductions in the in the department's five-year plan, so the answer is, as of today, no. For the next five years, for the next t through 2014, there's no planned reduction in coal use. No reduction of coal, so coal remain at the same level of the coal use. That's correct. Okay, the uh, neighborhood council and review. Do you deal with the neighborhood councils at all on your review? Um, we met with a neighborhood neighborhood council uh, working group uh, two weeks ago, and we've had a series of discussions with them. Okay, I just want to commend you on your objectivity, you, your integrity with this, because what we see is one report coming from the Water Power Commission, another report coming from you, and then the community and the business folks all up in arms. So I think that at least I have confidence in what you are presenting is real versus what I see coming from the commission is something pie in the sky that's going to hurt the business community and the residential people of Los Angeles. So I want to commend you on your uh, thorough report that really outlines what I think is realistic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Koretz. Thank you, Mr. President. I think a lot of the key issues in this debate uh, were covered in a letter that I sent to the DWP Commission and a response that I got from the mayor. Um, in a letter that said my approach would eviscerate LA's commitment to renewable energy, promote over-dependence on carbon-emitting fossil fuels, and set up LA rate payers for a crushing rate hike in 2012. Uh, that couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, my letter clearly is asking for the 0.8% rate increase for this quarter, um, with an understanding that more rate increases are pending. And this 0.8% rate increase, as it was already discussed, would allow the DWP to avoid unnecessary additional debt be, to be passed upon uh, onto their customers. At the same time, it would allow the council, neighborhood councils, and others, and the public, three months to go over this plan in detail to make sure that if we're engaging in this green commitment, that we're doing it in a well thought out way. Let me be clear, I'm not against the Energy Efficiency Trust Fund plan. I'm just against passing it on to ratepayers in an untested, unproven, and unvetted form. Also, to characterize my letter as anti-environmental, I think is simply inaccurate. I want an LA that has a long-term environmental plan. That's not part of this approach. I want an LA that gives up dirty coal. That's also not part of this approach. We don't cut out a single coal plant for at least five years. Also, Angelinos are suffering financially across our city, and I think giving pause to a massive rate increase is not such a bad idea. In fact, I think it's crucial in these times. And we need Angelinos behind us if we're going to do these, these large rate increases um, and move towards a greener future. I think right now we don't have them behind us. And I've been a director uh, or a board member of four different environmental organizations, so I'm the last one that's trying to decimate our environmental programs. Regarding beating the clock on state-sanctioned state carbon fines, I think we clearly need to do that, but we have to do it efficiently, effectively, and transparently. And lastly, I'd just say that Measure B, which I supported, 
I believe failed because of the rushed deliberations and the lack of transparency and people's response to that in the city of Los Angeles. And I ask that we not make that same mistake again. Mr. Mabange. Thank you very much. The CLA, if to the table, please. On uh, AB 32, if you could explain to everybody what we face in the future with AB 32. Oh. Um, <clears throat> sure. Well, I think you know PA can certainly address this too because I know it's something that they're very much involved in. Uh, AB 32, in essence, is it requires um, that the um, greenhouse gases be be reduced to I believe it's uh, 1990 levels by 2020 and 80 percent. Uh, of uh, by 2050, uh, state law, statewide regulation. Um, what has yet to be developed uh, are the regulations to implement uh, AB 32. Um, needs to be developed in conjunction with a variety of Western states. Um, so that will take some time to do. Um, it potentially could have a significant impact. In essence, it would, it would uh, be a cap and trade system and, and there would be uh, uh, penalties if you exceeded the... Uh, significant legislation. It is significant legislation. Significant legislation, although at a different time in 1958 when we stopped burning our trash in the backyard, a change in our habits. It is. It's, it's slated to go into effect in 2012, but again, that's contingent on the development of the regulations. Um, it's also important to note that there is an initiative uh, um, that's currently making the rounds um, uh, the desire is to get that on the November ballot that would extend the timetables for AB 32. Right. Uh, I do support the 245. I think it's important we review this here, but I think we have to look at the long term commitment that we have to make, whatever that is. I do think it was uh, articulate that the many uh, businesses from uh, Los Angeles came in here and they talk about going to Vernon. You know, we talk about uh, those things. Vernon, I believe, is municipal power. Uh, they may be required to do the same. Is that correct that Vernon is municipal power? And we're going to have water and power up here because I like to know, because I'm often afraid that someone leaves Los Angeles and goes to Burbank, which is municipal power, or Glendale, or Vernon. Uh, Long Beach municipal power? Edison? Edison. So these areas are important. We all want to improve our environment. Uh, but also, I don't want to see jobs lost in the industrial belt. Right. So municipal um, entities around us, so Burbank, Glendale, um, Vernon is municipal Pasadena. as well. Pasadena. Pasadena. Um, some of the larger uh, Sacramento municipal utility districts. Okay, I run a print shop in Pasadena. What's my rate compared to the printer in Burbank, Glendale, Vernon, Los Angeles? The... Uh, um, if offset press, six uh, color press, uh, web. Well, right now, if, if we look One at one printer in the house. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. But my... this is important, Jeff. Yeah, I agree. If you could just articulate that, so we could know, because it's very difficult to apply addition. Because the pride of DWP, which I have a lot of pride in my heart about DWP members, is that we have provided at this at a certain uh, cost. And now we're, we're going to have to come in a different direction, which is a challenge right now with all people, whether they're business or residential, which right. it makes it difficult for the council to support. But at the same time, we have to know what the field is so to make sure that we do not do what the vision of both uh, 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 all those Scattergood and, and Mulholland had in developing water power and probably what took place in this council chambers years ago. Right, and, and what we did a comparison against are the, are the three that are closest to us, Burbank, Glendale, and Pasadena. And the re reason we didn't do Vernon is a very, very small utility, uh, and, and it serves industrial customers mainly. Um, when you look at those comparisons, um, right now uh, we are below them probably in the uh, 15 to 25 percent range, somewhere in there based on the different utilities, and we'll have a presentation later that shows it. All right, well, let me ask you this question, Jeff. Could we create an industrial district if it matches the zoning that would help match competition to keep right. industrial-based businesses and jobs in L.A. and we, deal with this issue here? We, we have a number of rate packages you, that are, mm -hmm. are called our XRT and XCD, which look right. at um, load factors because a customer that comes in and has a better load factor, they stay level. We, we give those a, di a discount. And they shut we down voluntarily when you need the power. That's, again, we have another when they'll shut down voluntarily. We have that as well. I support further discussion Thank and you, support to look to the future. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Krikorian is our next speaker. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Um, let me say first how much I concur with uh, President Garcetti's introductory comments about how far this city has come in setting its environmental goals. Uh, the mayor has certainly focused a great deal of our attention on the importance of moving to a future of renewable energy. Uh, this council has, uh, has taken great steps in that way, and the employees of DWP uh, have made a tremendous commitment to that as well, and, and uh, I very much appreciate that as an Angelino and as somebody who's devoted a considerable amount of time uh, to helping to craft renewable energy energy policy myself. Um, for uh, over, well over a year, I chaired the Assembly Select Committee on Renewable Energy. And in that capacity, uh, I worked very, very hard to craft renewable energy policy for the state of California that would move us to a 33 percent RPS uh, by 2020, uh, that would encourage the kind of green jobs development in California uh, that our economy is going to be so dependent upon for the next century in my view. Um, and in doing that, we conducted over seven public hearings. Uh, we conducted dozens and dozens of stakeholder meetings. Um, we brought stakeholders um, from every sector of the economy uh, together into a room to try to craft a consensus policy for the development of renewable uh, power. And so I think that the reason that uh, Councilmember Perry's motion today is so important is precisely because that's what the city needs to do in a collaborative way. Uh, we need to have a common vision for how we get to achieve our renewable energy objectives um, and, and how we achieve our carbon footprint reduction objectives because we had a discussion earlier about the consequences of non-compliance with AB 32. Well, there's nothing in AB 32 that mandates a particular strategy of devote of, of a particular commitment to renewable energy in reducing carbon footprint. We have to reduce our carbon footprint. That could mean shifting to more natural gas and less coal. Certainly we have to get rid of coal. I think everybody agrees with that. But right now, as the PA consultant said, and, and if I'm quoting correctly, getting this right is absolutely critical. And we can't get it right if we rush this through without full participation uh, by this council. And at a time where small businesses throughout this city are being shuttered and people are losing their jobs, at a time when seniors are having to decide whether to buy food or prescription drugs or pay their utility bills, at a time when our schools are laying off teachers and are going to be further adversely impacted by rate increases, this is exactly the wrong time to rush through a policy to increase rates beyond what is absolutely critical to maintain the solvency of, of the department in this program right now. So I'm going to support uh, this motion and I very much hope that, uh, that we will continue to work collaboratively in this council with the department, with the mayor, with the stakeholders uh, to try to develop develop energy policy that works both fiscally and environmentally, creates the good jobs that we need for the next century, and that we do get it right. Thank you. Mr. Rosendahl is our next speaker. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, good afternoon, folks. A couple of quick questions. My constituents are freaking out. They're freaking out because all of a sudden they think they're going to get hit again on another bill. And, you know, mortgages, rent, food, kids, the whole thing is crushing a sensitivity right now. I've gotten more emails on this and concerns. Big question, the point oh eight, what will that mean to the average rate payer on their bill? Question one. Mark. Yeah, uh, this is Mark Hagan from PA Consulting. The uh, 0 0.8 cents per yeah. kilowatt hour. What is that? Would be a 6% increase on average, which for the average residential rate payer is $4 per month. Four bucks a month, which we get a bill every other month, so that's eight bucks. Eight dollars We're going to see an eight dollar raise in, 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 in our bill if we go forward. That's for the average residential customer. Okay. Second question. I'd like to have Miguel Santana come up for this. Um, we're hearing this little rumor about transfer of money to the general fund is somehow in jeopardy if we don't move forward with this. Is that in any way a case? And what is the story on our transfer? 
uh, when we originally budgeted, when you approved the budget, we uh, approved a budget with a transfer of $232 million. In the mid-year financial status report, we revised that number based on information we received from DWP that that number would be dropped to $220 million. Part of the deficit that we are assuming this year is a result of that drop. We received from DWP as of now $147 million of the $220 million that we budgeted. We still have a pending $73 million. Um, the the action that DWP took um, last week included an additional $20 million for the city as a result of cuts that they would be making. So the transfer, if, if the item that the DWP has approved were to be moved forward, the total transfer we should anticipate receiving is $93 million for this fiscal year. Um, the, the DWP has reported, I think it has been discussed, that they will have difficulty giving us the transfer without the approval of the increase. Um, Is that the whole increase or the 0.08? The, I mean, I should, you should have them answer that question. DWP, you want to answer that real quickly? I just don't know if we have a gun to our head or not to, to, to deal with our budget. Jeff Peltzola, the CFO for DWP. Um, council member, the 0.8 is for this quarter, and that 0.8 is necessary for us to meet our financial metrics in order to maintain that AA bond rating, and that's for the transfer that Mr. Santana just spoke of has to occur in this in this fiscal year. So all, all of that is is we do not meet our financial metrics if we stay at 0.1. Okay, but if you get the 0.08. General Treasury will get its money. At point eight, we we will have we will continue to meet our financial. Okay. Metrics. Last question for you is the carbon business, the carbon footprint, coal, and all that. Okay. Uh, the consultant there said you don't have a plan. Do you have a plan or what? Well, what I said just to be accurate was that the current five-year financial plan does not reduce coal usage. So. Um, Beyond that, there may be other plans within the department, but in their current fiscal plan, there are no costs associated with reducing coal usage. And I could comment on that a little bit. The, the way that we look at um, dispatching of our generating units is based on the marginal cost or the fuel cost. The fuel cost for a coal unit is in the area of two cents per kilowatt hour. So to the degree that we bring any of the renewables in, which are somewhere on the order of about 10 cents a kilowatt hour, they displace the highest um, the, the highest marginal cost, which is going to be natural gas, which is somewhere in the five cent per kilowatt hour range. So what it does is it displaces gas with the renewables. Obviously wind will have no CO2 production and the, the gas has somewhere on the order of about a thousand. But from an economic point right now, before you have any of these AB32 um, carbon fees, the, low, the one that will have the least rate impact to our customers is to displace the natural gas. When does AB32 go into play in terms of them really hitting us over the head? The, the, the rules have not been fully promulgated, but it's going to be in the 2012 um, calendar year, and that's what we're looking at as part of our integrated resources plan and what's the best way to do that by minimizing the rate impacts to our customers. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Mr. Alicorn. Members, we've uh, experienced uh, an economic crisis unseen by any of us, um, and one of the one of the facts of the matter is that during an economic crisis, your economy has to will, will contract, and then as it grows, you have an opportunity to define what you're going to grow into, whether you're going to continue the bad practices of the past or whether you're going to move forward with an aggressive program to try and correct some of the problems of the past. I think the DWP mayor's proposal is, is moving us in a direction to recognize that our economy has contracted and as we move forward there are going to be more businesses that will not succeed. But if they don't succeed, we want it to we want it to be for the right reasons, because we are moving our economy in a new direction. So this just this isn't just about the rate that 
that your ratepayers are paying in your districts. This is about what we are going to be as we grow our economy. I think this is a very aggressive proposal to move us toward greening. And we all support that. But that comes at a cost. And that means that some businesses will have to make some bottom line decisions about whether they can continue to operate under this new consensus. Because I believe it is a consensus. <clears throat> I have no problem with moving this into council for a better understanding of how the specific dynamics work. But at the end of the day, I hope that we make the same decision in general to support moving us toward a green economy, to support moving to create 16,000 green jobs, to support changing our DWP's culture into a culture that is futuristic toward improving our environment more than before. I also recognize that we, in this proposal, have protected the Tier 1 and Tier 2 users. That, we cannot forget that. We have authorized DWB to increase the rates, and if we approve, approve the reformed rates, we would, increase, uh, we would increase by less than what we approved before. For my district, that means that 60,000 customers will get a better rate than if we didn't approve this. And only 874, I'm sorry, 784 would get an increased rate. And it would be heavy, but that's the cost that we have to consider as to whether or not we want to move forward aggressively with a green portfolio. So I'm not going to sit here and criticize. I, I don't even have a problem with this. You know, I, I don't need an explanation of how 245 works. But on the other hand, I don't have a problem with this document. It's part of the discussion. Let's have a more, um, a more fervent discussion. Let's talk about the options. Let's see if we can spread the rate increase over time a little bit more. Let's see if we can, if we can reduce the hit on those constituents that we're concerned about. But by and large, let's do this. Let's move forward with a green agenda for the city of Los Angeles like no other major city has ever seen. I want to be a part of that. I think you want to be a part of that too. I know that, that the young people of Los Angeles want us to go in that direction. And that's what's going to keep them here, fighting for our city. So let's pull it into council. Let's get it done quickly. Let's move forward. I think we need to create more flexibility in terms of what purchases we, we make in the future. But by and large, I appreciate the fact that we have this opportunity to have this debate. So I don't have a problem. And you know the problems I've had with DWP. Um, but yeah, I sued them. I'm the only one who can say I, I sued the DWP uh, on, on these issues, on certain, uh, on the transfer issue. But at the same time, I appreciate getting this proposal because I believe it's going to move us forward. I appreciate the mayor presenting it to us. Let's refine it, but let's not destroy it. Mr. Wesson. Uh, thank you, Mr. President and members. Uh, I think that uh, Jan should be commended for uh, making this request of us because this is some very important, serious, uh, this is a very important, serious challenge that we face and it should be done with us giving it the amount of thought that it uh, is, is due. And Richard, I agree with you in the sense that, uh, you know, Los Angeles and California, I mean, the winds in this country blow from west to east, and it is our responsibility to uh, set an example. I, I truly, truly agree with that. And I want to harken back to Measure B. I remember when that came through, and we there were suggestions that we moved a little too fast, that it happened too fast. And yes, there were a lot of uh, statements from the public saying, no, I'm against it, I'm against it, I'm against it. But there were also a significant of uh, members from the public that said, well, I think green. Let me vet this. Let the neighborhood councils discuss this. Let the chamber advise us. So, so I, I do believe that is it important that we have that discussion. And maybe if we would have had that discussion then,
and we allowed Los Angelinos to really participate in that discussion, we might be in a better or a different situation uh, today. Just maybe. Now, I do want to ask, so in theory, I am supportive, but we uh, hired you to do a job for us, correct? Yes. We paid them some fun. You guys are experts in your field, correct? Yes, we are. I just, it doesn't make sense to me that we would hire experts and not listen. I mean, they did the job that we hired them to do, and I think we should listen to them. Now, I do have a, a couple of uh, quick questions, one where it relates to you. You said, in the meantime, an increase of 0.08 would suffice where it relates to us maintaining our bond rating? Yeah, so the process that we envision where the ECAF is reconstituted, the rates are looked at, we believe that can be done over a three to four month period. The point, the point zero 0.08 increase, we believe, is more than sufficient for the department to meet its cash requirements during that period. So you're saying you are recommending the 0.08 for one quarter, not for, not yet until you're recommending one quarter and a reconstitution, and I'll let you say that. Yeah, so a one-time 0.08 increase now, or as soon as possible, and then further increases are based on reconstituting the ECAF, looking at the individual components in both the RPS and DSM programs, because we believe there may be some opportunities to mitigate the size of the rate increase if those are looked at in a more critical way. And so I think the 2.7 could change over this next three to four months. But the 0 0.08 now and then reconstituting ECAF will have, I think, a very beneficial effect on the bond rating agencies. Also by reconstituting the ECAF and, and having it only contain the commodity portion and uncapping that, um, that's something the bond agencies will look at very favorably because it removes an enormous amount of financial risk from the department. It was the capped nature of the commodity portion that led to PG&E's bankruptcy during the energy crisis. So it's something that rating agencies are very critically focused on. Changing that will have a very positive effect so you get some positive effect without a rate increase, and then the 0 0.08 will, I think, help. It won't last forever, um, but it certainly, I think, will give you enough time to do the other steps necessary. And, and Mr. President or Ms. Perry, I don't know who's the appropriate person to answer the question. As we move forward and we further vet and discuss this, and let's say that we will want to include uh, Los Angelinos as well, will this consulting firm be at our side helping us properly vet uh, this information, or is their work done? I, I, the CLA can maybe speak to the contract and whether PA, PA still has uh, uh, an outstanding balance. I can just balance. push my button. Oh, yeah. why, why doesn't the CLA answer I do answer want to hear the answer. answer. No, we, uh, we continue to have them on contract, and they will be available for any additional analysis that we need. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Reyes. Thank you, Council President. You know, I'm looking at this energy cost adjustment factor, carbon reduction surcharge. It's an issue briefing for the honorable members of the LA Council by the Office of the Mayor, March 22nd. On page 14, and if I can ask the CLA and the CAO to come up. Is the CAO here? Is anybody from the CAO's office in, in the building? Mr. Ace, I'm sorry. Looking for uh, Mr. Santana? Yep. Mr. I think he's around here. Mr. Santana, here? We'll see if we can find him. Hold on one second. Well, I'll make it brief. There are assertions here that I find a little troubling. 
And I'd like to uh, get a report back for the committee, assuming that the report does come to the committee and we do assert jurisdiction. But to state that a rejection of the action would be a direct route to that word, uh, to me is rather startling to see this in writing and almost uh, almost irresponsible in, in a way. So if we can go through each bullet and get a report back to see if this is true. Uh, and just for the record, understand that the condition of today's city's finances has a lot to do with the world economy, has a lot to do with the national economy, has a lot to do with many, many factors. And one decision regarding DWP action does not lead us to that conclusion. But for the sake of the record, I'd like for this to be a report back uh, and a clear understanding of what these actions really mean. Because uh, I think it's, it's important that the public understand the transparency of our decisions and how it is a very complicated uh, process. And to see this is, is rather startling for me. So we can, can we get that? That's what I wanted the CO to be at the table to see if they can respond to this. Would you, would you like me to respond here or report back in committee? Or, um... Well, if we can do something brief here, that'd be great. Well, but I'd like to see it in writing. In, uh... Sure, we, we'd be happy to, to do that as well. But um, uh, our, our reserve fund balance this year does assume that we get the, supplement, the additional $73 million transfer from the DWP. Um, if, if we don't go get that, clearly there will be cash flow issues before the end of the year. Um, and, and if we don't get that, we will have to find ways of dealing with that, and, and we will. Um, but I think what's before you and what's going to be happening through committee in next week is to uh, evaluate um, the mayor's proposal, evaluate uh, PA's proposal for the 0.8 increase, which would, of course, make, make this moot, to suggest that if, if you don't approve the board action itself, it will lead to anything, um, is, is, is not necessarily true. It's going to depend ultimately on what the, the council uh, will accept uh, and, and whether the board approves that in the next week or so. Okay. Well, it's unfortunate to say it was not at the table because I'd like to get a report from him as well. Because, again, um, for the sake of clarity and uh, integrity of the process, to be... Uh, responsible for these kinds of words I think is, is, is important and to understand what that means and how it impacts decision makers uh, requires a little bit more sophistication in how we address this issue. Thank you. Ms. Perry. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. Um, if I could get uh, the CFO from Department of Water and Power to uh, come to the table for a second, um, I would appreciate it. Um, and you know that I've said this a couple of times um, in committee meetings, and I said it again last night, and I have asked uh, as long ago as last fall uh, for a, a plan from the Department of Water and Power to tell us on the record in a transparent manner what your plan is to reduce uh, operating expenses, and to date I had not gotten this plan, um, although uh, in a meeting last night uh, you alluded to it, and so I, I just want to get a commitment from you on the record when we go to committee uh, this Thursday. Are you going to give me that plan? I, I can. I can do that now, or I can do it in the committee. Uh, you can do it now, and you can do it again in committee. Okay. Uh, I want you to uh, do that because I, I've grown very tired of asking the same question over and over and over again. Um, the other thing I want to say to you is this, um, just for clarification for people who are listening, the reduction of coal in this ECAF plan does not exist. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so coal will continue as it is for the next five to ten years and our usage of it in this plan as it's currently drafted. Is that correct? If I could clarify, right now the plan that PA, that PA reviewed was out through the five-year plan that had no consideration of the uh, cost for AB 32. Those costs will be, uh, once those are triggered, the coal will, will be reduced 
um, based on what those costs are. And if you look in there, there's some quite significant costs that we have for the CO2. So I would not want to characterize it while the plan they reviewed had no impact from AB32, when the impacts of AB32, which will be part of that integrated resources plan, um, I would foresee that there will be a coal reduction because the marginal cost of coal will be so much higher. Okay, um, I'm just going to let, let you speak about the reduction okay. of um, In, your operating expenses. And if I could, uh, yeah. we're going to. Yeah. And also, if you can review uh, for for people watching today, add into that your review of the Fitch, the last Fitch, Fitch bond rating report. Okay. All right. And, and so they're going to put up. If we go to page eight of the presentation, which is up, and, and that has the best uh, review. Just this background, um, DW paid back in the early 90s for the power system, and we are two separate systems, had 8,200 um, employees. We now have 6,244 power employees, so that's a 24% reduction in the number of employees that we have. In sales, we're serving currently about 24,000 gigawatt hours compared to about 20,000 that we had in 93, 94. So that's an 18% increase in sales. So part of you, just as the background before I go into those cost reductions, we are serving 18% more product with 24% less employees than what we had um, serving less product before that back in the early 90s. The things that we've done, and just high level on this because I know we don't have a lot of time, A, we've frozen base rates for 2010-2011. We have had a series of, of three base rates over the last three fiscal years, including the year we're in, but next year will be a flat base rate. So we have not asked for any base rate increase um, that we had that, that was uh, for the 10-11 fiscal year, even though with the cost, we basically made it up with efficiencies. The, the recent review that we had, if you look in the second bullet in the underlying portion, is the objective was to trim cost to absolute minimum if the costs were not directly related to the 20% RPS by 2010 or power system infrastructure goal. So we went from a top to bottom review and looked at everything we had and we brought our RPS right in line at 20% where previously it was something higher, it was about 24% in 2010. And the power system infrastructure goals, if it wasn't related to that, we made reductions. What that results in, and you can see in the third bullet, these are all five-year numbers. Our reduced capital expenditures was about 745 million, and a big piece of that was the Pine Canyon Wind Project. We eliminated that project. Decreased labor costs, 189 million, as a result of the MOU that we were here for um, a number about a month ago. That has reduced our costs and our cost projections by about 189 million. The renewable energy projects, we eliminated two of the higher cost wind projects that resulted in 154 million dollars of, of ECAF. So the review that PA Consulting has looked at includes all of these reductions, including about 600 million dollars of off balance sheet debt related to those two projects. At the end of all of that, that the bottom line and what you're looking at is about a reduction of one cent per kilowatt hour, which is about 240 million dollars. So all of these reductions that we've done, um, while those in that third bullet are not dollar for dollar, they have all resulted in about a $240 million reduction compared to what you looked at, um, I believe, in August or September. Okay. And the Fitch? Thank you. Um, and the Fitch? Oh, sorry. Go okay, ahead. and then the Fitch report. I'm sorry. Um, we, we have recently re um, received our rating from Fitch, and and part of what that review was, the plan that they looked at is consistent um, with the 0.8 increase that w that we had. And to just read the the key element of that, a pending change to the rate structure that is being considered for approval by the board on March 18th is also viewed as a positive credit development in that it brings LADWP much closer to a position of full cost recovery on a timely basis. Um, that is a key part of what Fitch is looking at, is that we have a 0.8 cent increase um, to our rates, because I think universally, and I don't want to speak for PA, but at 0.1, we cannot continue as a AA uh, rated uh, utility. Thank you. Um, I'm going to return to Mr. Reyes, just because Mr. Santana is here, and then after that, Ms. Hahn will be our next speaker. Thank you, Council President. I thank Mr. Santana for being here. I'd like to ask who in the mayor's office wrote this. I understand Mr. Zabel. Was that you? I, 
I just want to understand, given the environment we're in, and knowing how sensitive all these issues are, to make these assertions, do you, is that what you truly believe, given the statements that were made here? Well, I mean, from the mayor's office perspective, and I would, I would actually want to defer to, to the CAO, um, given that it, we're looking at three more months left in this fiscal year, if we were to open up an additional $73 million hole in a budget this fiscal year, um, uh, we're hard-pressed to figure out how we would actually close that uh, without having some serious cash flow issues. And in the briefing you had before you there, um, what we do is we outline the steps. We don't say that, you know, that it will, it's, it's not a cause and effect, but if we fail to get the additional $73 million, it will set, up, set us off uh, on a financial tailspin that could lead to some significant solvency issues. But I've got to you know, defer to the CAO. It says here, council rejection of DLP's board action would be the most immediate and direct route to bankruptcy the city could pursue. We shouldn't even be even using those terms. Well, that term should not even be in this document because we are trying to build up credibility. We're trying to build up confidence. And this type of verbiage does not do that. Well, but Mr. Reyes, um, we have a responsibility to lay out the actual consequences. Okay, so let me so ask the, the CAO, is this breathed. something that would actually happen given that assertion? Um, I apologize for not being here because I, I wanted to speak directly to the mayor after reading that comment. And um, he expressed that under no circumstance would he ever support bankruptcy uh, for the city of Los Angeles. Uh, and let me be clear, the city of Los Angeles is not going bankrupt. Uh, it has been clear by, by this body and by the mayor that bankruptcy is not an option under any circumstance. And uh, he, has, he, he asked me to relay those comments. Having said that, I think what uh, Mr. Zabel is articulating is that if we do not receive the anticipated transfer, we are going to face um, an additional burden in this fiscal year. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to get into whether or not we'll get it. I think ultimately that's a decision DWP has to make. But this year's budget assumes that $73 million. Um, and so that even in light of the deficit that certainly all of you have are well informed of, if we were not to receive that transfer, we would have to move quickly to figure out what services we would need to focus on, sit down with the controller and determine when will the city literally run out of cash. Um, and so that does not equal bankruptcy. Bankruptcy is something, an action that uh, is, you do when you have no other options. The city will continue to have options, very difficult options before us. Um, and so that, that point of cl clarification needs to be made. Well, the steps that we're going to be taking, I just conferred with the chairman of the committee, is that we'll be meeting on Thursday. Friday is a day by which we can act responsibly to make sure we prevent what you just said. So I just want to protect not only the city of Los Angeles, but the institution of the council, so that we're not framed as a cause for that action. And that's something that needs to be made very, very clear. We spent hundreds and hundreds of hours taking care of our personnel, our families, our city, and that those terms should not be touched on so lightly. So I rarely get to this point. I don't like behaving this way. But I think this kind of statement is irresponsible. Ms. Hahn? No, um, thank you. And I, I will say um, I am I, I'm definitely supporting, you know, this action today, the, the, the 245. I think that's what's responsible. I think we absolutely have a right and a duty to explore this in a way that uh, makes sense. And I think that's what we're trying to do, is make sense of, of these proposals. And I just want to, um, to the consultants, I just wanted to refresh my own memory on why you're here, who are you, 
who hired you and for what reason. And basically, uh, the department proposed this rate increase last October. And again, we asked for, and I, I always want to thank Greg Smith, who was really um, the, the architect of this idea that every time we're faced with a proposal from our Department of Water and Power that um, involves rate increases that we have this sort of third party independent analysis on do we need it, is it warranted, is this the right time, and can you provide the background and facts to us that this is indeed um, a, a right request from our department for a rate increase. So that's kind of why we're here. Um, and you gave us your report uh, just recently. And you basically, in very simple terms, what does your report say? What, what are you recommending? Very simple. So the point eight increase as soon as the council can can um, act. Any further rate increase is subject to. And why did you why why the point oh eight? So we looked at all of the department's um, financials and we looked at their financial plan and we looked at a reasonable amount of scenarios as to things that can happen in the near term. And for them to meet the cash requirements that they need to maintain their bond rating, we think that is the right increase. And it is actually more than the department had originally asked for. We thought the right. original request. So basically, was, the department asked for more. No, less. I mean, less. And you came in and said, not only do we think you need that, we're actually recommending that you ask for more. Yeah. Um, we didn't think it was sufficient to cover real world events, changes in commodity prices, forced outages, things like that. We thought the department was at a razor thin margin. So what we recommended we think gives them some cushion, not a lot of cushion, um, but some. But we also, we also think the, the full 2.7 shouldn't be granted at this time. There's too much work to be done um, reconstituting the ECAP as I talked about making it much more transparent so that the costs of the programs are much easier to understand going going forward. But you think ultimately that the 2.7 is also warranted. What's the difference between what you're recommending and what the board adopted? I think that's a little bit of the confusion here today. So I think there's significant differences between what we're recommending and the okay. board. Um, one, the carbon surcharge um, trust fund is not something that's recommended by PA. We believe there should be a separate account for RPS, but it shouldn't be a trust fund. It should be funded by a rate surcharge that's where the costs are directly relevant to what's been approved by the council to date. No future costs are baked into it under our recommendation. So we believe enough costs to cover the current commitments to get to 20%. If there's going to be an increase beyond that, they would have to come back to the council and say, we want to get to 25% or 30% or 35%. That's a key, excuse me, key difference between what the board has recommended. But both, both of you are Thank recommending you, the 2.7 cents. We're, we're saying under the current five-year plan, we think it could get to 2.7. We don't think that is ultimately where it should end up, but we think if you follow the plan, if you make no further changes, it could get there. Um, but we think it could also be less. And that's why we think this process will help you understand that. Okay, and I know I'm almost out. Oh, uh, not only am I out. You are out, actually over. over, if you don't mind pressing your button. Let, again, let me just Ms. say, because I know some of other members have had a, a little bit speak. more time. Uh, I think what's also disturbing from the department on this is uh, the idea that either way, we don't have a good plan for um, reducing our dependence on, on coal. And I think that has got to be key in what we're hearing in the next few days. If this is approved, we need to know that there is a plan from the department to reduce our dependency on coal. So far, that hasn't been brought forward. We need that. Mr. Gardens. There's a lot of good people at the Department of Water and Power, a lot of smart people. Uh, Ramon, 
you're a really smart guy, but unfortunately sometimes it seems as though some people are forced to come into venues like this and really just, I guess, toe some line of whatever's going on over there sometimes. And I'm going to refer to a historical event that happened here in the city of Los Angeles. And the reason why I think that we should 245 this and the reason why I support it is because right now, in my opinion, the Department of Water and Power is dealing with decisions of making rate increases of upwards of 20% over time without transparency. I do agree that we need to go in a greener direction. However, at the same time, at this point in time, I can't trust that the Department of Water and Power is going to efficiently and responsibly use the people's green properly with this increase as it's spelled out today. So I'll give you a case in point. When I chaired the committee that now Jan Perry care, uh, chairs that oversees issues like this and is brought into the council, I uncovered the fact that, and I spoke about it here on the floor, a fact, I got a hold of a letter that was signed by the then head of the Department of Water and Power, David Freeman, who happens to be the head of the Department of Water and Power again today. And in that letter, it talked about how a mitigation project was only going to cost about, uh, capping out at about $150 million for that mitigation project. Today, that mitigation project is costing the ratepayers of Los Angeles upwards of $450 million. What I also uncovered years after David Freeman's letter where he convinced by sitting here verbally and reading his letter to the city council said it should be capping out at about $150 million. So the city council voted and said that's fine. Today that same project is costing upwards of $450 million. What I also uncovered at that time was the fact that Mr. Freeman had a report by the Parsons organization they did a fine report and they said it could cost as much as $450 million. But he did not tell the council that. He only told the council that it might cost as much as $150 million, but did not tell the council that he was in possession of a report that said it could cost as much as $450 million. And lo and behold, it is costing us upwards of $450 million. But the council at that time was only privy to the idea that it could cost $150 million. That's the main reason why we need to 245 this. That's the main reason why we as the city council, the elected body of the city, the legislative body, has oversight on these matters of the Department of Water and Power. There's a reason for that. And today is a glaring reason for that. Sometimes good people at the Department of Water and Power are forced to carry the water of some agenda that is not exposed until we start peeling it back, peeling it back, peeling back, and then finally get down to the truth. And my last point is this. My last point is this. The Department of Water and Power can convene the board of the Department of Water and Power and actually agendize and vote on an issue that we can agree on, which is the 0.8 cents increase. We can all agree on that. They could vote on that. And perhaps the city council because we agree on that, we understand the urgency of the April 1st and the sky is falling by the document put out by the mayor's people, that that is the one issue that has tremendous relevance when it comes to time, the element of time and urgency. I think we can agree on that. And they can, in, that, in fact, convene a meeting as soon as 24 hours from right now. Maybe 25 hours, maybe 26 hours. I've seen them do it when they're motivated on their own agenda to do so. Mr. Labanche. Uh, just a question here. When you look at all this stuff here in this transfer, I see the transfer as property taxes to the over hundreds of uh, distribution stations and facilities. I know we argue that. Have you looked at that at all, or how do you see the transfer? They don't pay property taxes. Now, if this was Edison, like it once was, and the people didn't have the vision that they did 100 years ago to create municipal power here, it would be a different story. But how do you see? I think the transfer payment is very similar to something that Edison or PG&E or San Diego Gas and Electric or SoCal Gas pays, which is a franchise fee. So it's, cust it's customary. Um, because it's municipally owned, I think the transfer is, is done differently. But the net effect is very, very similar 
it's a it's it's reasonable and customary. It replaces property tax and, and the franchise fee. So to, so I'm kind of like on the right focus on that. You would agree? Yeah, I think so. Very good. Thank you. Could I have the representative from the department? Uh, just a technical question. I know the water side. This is a simple question. On the water side, the busiest day, Mr. Rosendahl, the busiest day for water, believe it or not, usually is in a late January, early February on a Sunday. Halftime of Super Bowl. That's the truth. Okay, the busiest day for the water system. On the power system, what's the average for the day used like today? How much does it cost to bring this power to the John Ferraro chambers? Uh, on average for the entire system. For the entire city. The entire system, it's roughly seven and a half million dollars um, to bring power for the 24 hour period. Seven and a half million dollars for a day. That's a great investment. How much do you think we make in revenue to provide that, do you know? Is it anywhere near that, or is it a little? Uh... No, it, well, no. That's the cost is going to be seven and a half million. So that's going to be somewhat above that for for the revenue. But again, that's where we've got to be able to have the fund future capital expenditures and have additional amount of net income somewhere in the four hundred million dollar range. And the run a power company takes three things, right? Generation, transmission, and distribution. Correct. And our generation has been challenged because of environmental issues. I, I saw the, the vision, I mean, I wasn't here at the time in the sense, but what we thought of where we got our water, where we got our power, uh, but now as times change, your whole industry, uh, PG&E is having the same discussion, right? Right. There's uh, throughout again the uh, all of the AB32 is going to is going to transform. What is the best and most cost-effective way to bring power to Los Angeles? And Edison's having this discussion. They are all having the discussion. San Diego Gas Electric. Do they have a public building like this that the public comes in and discuss it, or is it more a little boardroom? They, they the PA could probably answer better what the. Well, can you answer this out of curiosity? The uh, the utilities have to file plans with the Public Utilities Commission that get discussed by the Public Utilities Commission. And very few people get to come to a public microphone and voice their concerns unless they travel to Sacramento or San, San Francisco. Francisco. Yeah. San Francisco, wherever it is. So this is important to have this engagement there too. But I think it's important to know how much it costs a, a day, seven and a half million, that's a tremendous investment Correct. for uh, to bring the power here. Thank all those who bring the power. Let's see in the future if we can improve the power to continue to help Los Angeles be a great city. Thank you. Mr. Parks for the first time. Oh, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you, Mr. President. Uh, could I have uh, uh, the representative from the mayor's office and also uh, DWP to the table, please? I, I was trying to get through this discussion without having to push my button, but one of the things I want to ask DWP, within the last two weeks, uh, your department came before the Budget and Finance Committee on the initial part of the transfer, and a specific question was asked of your department, when was the second half of the transfer coming? And I don't know, were you the representative there? Do you recall the answer you gave us? The, the answer that I talked about is that we had um, drastically increasing uh, power costs, which is much of what, what we're going through today. We've got... Uh, no, no. Did you get specifically the answer you gave us about when is the 73 coming? Yeah, we, we said we fully plan on making that um, within the next couple of months. You said over the next couple of months. Did you ever say that the city should not expect any of the money? I did not say that. Okay. Uh, the issue, when when is that come about that where we went from 73 million to zero? Again, what I've looked at is our projections and our plans are always counting on that we get this 0.8 cent increase as of April 1. So when you gave us the, the answer within two months and this has not been approved, what were you talking about in two months? What were we going to get? The, the again with the planned 0.8 cent because the PA okay, report but this wasn't was approved. No, this, this was not approved. Okay, when we asked you the question, what were we going to get, and you said within two months, what were you referencing, and how much was it? It was 73 million dollars. Okay, so you were talking about 73 million dollars, knowing that this item had not been approved. It, it had not been approved that okay. time. Okay, and you said within two months. Correct. And I think we responded to you. Can you do it sooner? And I believe I said no. Okay. But the issue, you never said 73 was not in our future. Correct. Okay. The thing I'd like to ask the mayor's office is that your bullet number two on page 14, 
how do we reconcile that today we're saying DWP may not have 73 million, but yet in bullet two you're saying if we approve it, we can get 93 million. How does that reconcile? It, uh, it reconciles because uh, part of the board report, which was passed uh, last week, includes an additional uh, number of cuts and efficiencies, um, which would allow the department to uh, provide a one-time supplemental transfer to the city's general fund uh, based directly on those, on those cuts. So if that board report is rejected um, by the council and remanded back to the uh, to the board in uh, in favor of uh, another propo a proposal. Um, those those cuts would not go through. That additional 20 million would not be transferred to the general fund. Uh, as it relates to the 73 million, um, the 73 million assumes the 0.8 increase, and it assumes that the department would not be uh, in at risk of a downgrade from the rating agencies. But should should but no one has ever said during budget and finance and when that report was brought here that it was contingent that this had to be approved or there would be no 73 and the first time we saw that we could have now get another 20 it just didn't make sense that you can all of a sudden have zero and then jump to 93 uh, immediately and then it could be done before june 30th and the, re the reason why it, the 73 would go to zero is that the estimate from their partner and mr uh, portola can uh, can discuss this further if, if the department were to be downgraded, the additional uh, costs uh, in borrowing would range somewhere between 70 to 80 million dollars. Therefore, the 73 million in, tra in, in the transfer would uh, disappear. But let me ask you, is there a likelihood the department could be downgraded when the most recent Fitch report says they have one billion dollars in reserve? Is there a likelihood of getting downgraded with that kind of reserve? And the, if you look at that reserves that, that you've identified, half of that roughly, I think it's $540 million, if I'm correct, is the Debt Reduction Trust Fund, which is a restricted fund that can be used for, the, for debt and, and for, for debt and other debt service payments. Um, the other remaining transfer or the other remaining cash balance, again, was before the 147 is transferred. And again, what, what uh, all three of the rating agencies looked at was the 0.8 cent increase consistent um, with the plan, uh, or consistent with, with the PA recommendation at the time is the 0.8 cents. So all of the rating agencies assume that we will get the 0.8 cents starting in April and going forward with our, with our costs. But I think when the Fitch report articulated, the $1 billion they mentioned was uh, basically is that the liquidity was such that it was a sum of money. It didn't say this money was allocated. It didn't say it was encumbered. It said that the liquidity was just under one billion in reserve. And, and if you give me a minute, I can find it where it identifies because half of that is. And then it says you have 177 days of cash available. Right, and if you look above like, that, was that it, six months or close to it? If you look above that, it talks about LADWP's liquidity was strong with 445 million in unrestricted operating cash and 547 million in the debt reduction fund, mm -hmm. which acts as a hedge for for the utility's variable rate debt exposure and can be used in the future to economically defease debt or to pay current debt service costs. But they're, they're so, combining those two, and they're saying they're both liquid. Right, and again, if this assumes you, the one thing that has not been um, discussed today, our ECAF is increasing from 1.3 billion to almost 1.9 billion in the course of two years. Okay. Our, our operating costs are, are increasing drastically, and any projection we look at with that 0.1 cent, and this is something that we can go through committee. Or I've, I've got a graphic to show it. We will start losing or under collecting a tremendous amount of money at 0.1 cents. Could you do me a favor when you come to committee for Ms. Perry's uh, committee? Could you give us a clear picture that? If we didn't approve anything, how much of the 73 we'd get? If we approved the 0.8, how much of the 73 we'd get? And then where is that 20? Uh, is that only if the entire package is approved, or is it part of the 0.8? Okay. All right. Mr. Smith. Call the question. Question's been called. Mr. Clerk, please open the roll on this. We'll close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 15 eyes.
Excellent. Thank you very much. Now we have to vote on the uh, 245 itself. Uh, Mr. Clerk, please open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 15 eyes. All right. Council has asserted jurisdiction. Thank you very much. Um, that matter. That matter will be heard in committee. The matter will be heard in committee this coming Thursday, and we will uh, calendar for council next week, hopefully next Friday. But please make sure you pay, pay close attention to what's posted on the city's website. Uh, there's been a thank you very much, everyone, for your uh, words today, and thank you to PA Consulting. And thank you for all of those who came down and took times out of your busy day, all of you, uh, for sitting here today and being very, very patient and uh, sharing your viewpoint and being patient and respectful of each other. Uh, Mr. Garcetti, uh, I believe you asked for item five to be taken out of order? And that was called special by Councilmember Parks. Mr. Parks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, let the controller's personnel come up. <laughs> Can we, can yeah, we go to another item? Uh, Ms. Grew's on her way down and we can get something else done before she gets here. You want to hold this item on the desk? Yes. Okay, then uh, we'll in Mr. A Garcetti, do you want to jump back to the item number four right now? No. no. All right, we'll hold five on the desk. Four is pending. What's the next item we have? Item three was okay. called special for cards. All right, I'll call the cards on item three now. Um, John Walsh, are you still here? John Walsh, come on up. And after John Walsh will be Mr. Matthew Dowd. Is Mr. Matthew Dowd present? Mr. Dowd is not present in the chamber. Mr. Walsh is going to speak in a minute. And then La, uh, Maria Fiscal. Maria Fiscal. Is Maria still here? Okay, Ms. Fiscal does not appear to be present in the chamber. And then we will go to Van Eyes. John Walsh blogging at Hollywood Highlands, H I G H L A N D S dot org. 400,000 visitors since September 3rd of last year. Uh, this item concerns budget balancing. How to balance the budget. And as you saw in the previous item, we have a mayor going on public television radio and talking about the city going bankrupt. We have a mayor running around saying the city's going bankrupt. Remember when it's the psychotic ravings of John Walsh match the city council, there's something desperately wrong in this city. And what's desperately wrong in this city is a mayor who isn't interested in balancing the budget. He's interested in being on NPR. It's also a city that won't realize and talk about the number one evil anti-green thing in the city. And that is the DWP gets 20% of its energy from a nuclear reactor in Colorado, but the green meanies have signed a deal off, so now nuclear energy is politically correct when a couple of years ago it was politically incorrect. So if you want to end the whole world, if you want to make us sick from coal, you know what to do. If you want to end the whole world, support the DWP's nuclear energy plant. And I'm telling you right now, balancing the budget is going to be very, very difficult when we have a mayor and look at our website and we will be talking about the exact prescription drugs the mayor is on now. HollywoodHighlands.org. We have a mayor in serious, serious physical, psychological problems. Distress. Thank you. Mr. Matthew Dowd, uh, Ms. Fiscal, Maria Fiscal. All right, uh, now we will go to Van Nuys for Donna Pierman. Okay, 
Yeah, hello. Anyway, the mayor isn't interested in balancing the budget and ruining the city. They're trying to ruin the middle uh, middle class and starve them out, giving the upper middle class and the rich uh, and the rich people richer, and making the CRA richer and developers and big businesses. Most of the cuts that you're talking about on the budget are really hurting the city. You hear all these different agencies reminding people that are uh, that are that they are needed: animal services, parks and recs, libraries. The furloughs are backfiring, especially in essential services like sanitation. Our tykes break if not taken care of in a timely manner. We end up having the employees work on overtime. No savings. When the city does sacrifices, only makes you, uh, it only wants, um, you want more. When, when you reward city employees for their sacrifices, how can you base a budget without reduction to the CRA? I see uh, a large... Oh, I see a lot of businesses, eight in Canoga Park, that went out of businesses in the CRA area. Without revenues from the digital billboards, without the revenues from the marijuana collectives, don't close them, use them, um, use them for revenue. And when the CRA, and it's taking all our tax increment money, it's really a joke to make any budget cuts. We uh, to ask anything to be cut from the city as long as the CRA is taking all the money. We need to stop giving all the money to CRA, stop having a lot of projects. The businesses in the areas that I have the CRA are slowly going out. And you're also telling the city employees that you don't care for them. Uh, you just keep on asking them to uh, give up sacrifices, and the more they give up sacrifices, the more you ask, but you don't really ask to, uh, from yourselves. Think about the six, empl uh, six city employees, I mean the six city councils who are not giving their raise Thank you up. very much, Ms. Pierman. Back to City Hall. Uh, there are no speakers in the queue on this side, and would you please open the roll? Madam President, there is no action required on this today. Okay, great. So we should note and file? There's no action at all. No action. All right, we'll move on. And then uh, just quickly, uh, I see the controllers here, but we'll take item four up first. And I'm going to call the residents up to the mic. And I would like for you to line up uh, so we can go through this. David Carrera, are you here? David Carrera, come on up. John Walsh, are you still here? John Walsh, come on up. Susan. All right, Mr. Walsh, you're down to your last minute for today. Uh, Susan McCann. Bill uh, Belsha, Bill Belsha, Maria Hinton, Betty Walker, Scott Campbell, William Ross, and Isabel Beruta. And All right, Mr. Ma Madam President, this is a reminder, this is a fair hearing matter requiring the council members heightened attention to the speaker at the podium or to their monitors at their desks. All right, uh, members, this is a fair hearing ma matter, a quasi-judicial hearing, and I would like to request that all members be in their seat and, and give, it, give the speakers your undivided attention right now. Thank you. Mr. Carrera. Yes, I'm speaking on item number five, um, and now... This case is, is so messed up and so convoluted that you don't even have a chance of understanding it. It's, it takes people about three hours before they even understand. We've got multiple um, entitlements, a density bonus, commercial parking in a residential zone. It goes on and on. MNDs have been issued and then changed. But there's one thing that you might understand, and that's the rear yard. Um, the The Area Planning Commission had decided that the rear yard be five feet at this point, the height of the project was undecided. So they had decided that the rear yard be five feet, and if it went over, uh, the height went over 30 feet, the rear yard would increase for one horizontal foot, uh, for each foot over. Now, where it gets tricky is that the language that went into the APC decision by planning referred back to the density bonus, and now we're told that that language, even though it's in the density bonus, is invalid and it won't be followed. So the only thing I'm asking today is that the tract before you be amended to to reflect the, the, the intent of the APC. I'm not asking for anybody to advocate for our side or anything else. All I want is the truth. 
Uh, it's on tape. It's clear as day what was intended by the APC. It's important that it goes into the tract for a number of reasons. One, the applicant doesn't appear to have any intention of uh, honoring the APC's decision. And two, the, the tract becomes very important as, as to quote Mike Young from planning where he says that when you're looking at a vesting map, you're looking at the building footprint as well as the building envelope. And we just want that reflected in the rear yard. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Walsh, your, this is your last minute for today. Thank you. You seem so happy it's my last minute. It could be my last minute of my life. Who knows? Maybe I'll drop dead here. I'm, I wouldn't be the first one to drop dead at City Council Chambers. That's true. Mr. Finn did. And in fact, I, I live in Hollywood. This is a Hollywood issue. I want to explain this to people out here. These density bonuses just pile people on top of one another. Endless growth. Go to endlessgrowth.com right after you go to hollywoodhighlands.com to find out the answer to everything is just squeeze more density in. They're fighting over density. Everyone will fight over density. Go to hollywoodhighlands.org. Finish for the day. If you want to find out why the turnstiles don't work at MTA, come to hollywoodhighlands.org. Susan McCann. Hello. I just want to say that I'm opposed to the massive changes that will occur if this project is approved in its present form. I know it's very complex, and I'll try and simplify it. Um, we are in a street that's dead end, very small, and most of the bungalows are about 1,100 square feet. Their 11 units will total 54,000 square feet. This will negatively impact our street. We're not opposed to either of the two projects, but the two together, that is a commercial parking with 78 spaces and the 11 huge residential units um, will be too large for a very small street. And I also want to reiterate what Mr. Carrera said. We went to this meeting, the APC meeting, and it was debated over three hours, and we felt that it was settled because they put the rear yard set back together with the height, and we want to see that reflected in the tract. It should be, uh, it was settled. We don't know why we're going through this all again. Okay? Thank you very much. Bill Belsa? Mr. Bell is not here. Maria Hinton. Thank you. My home is located just west of the proposed Leland condo project. Uh, we, the neighbors on Leland Way, are going into our third year fighting to preserve our neighborhood from this ill-conceived project. This combined condo and commercial parking project is a monstrous distortion of what SV 1818 was meant to do. This residential property on our narrow dead-end street was not meant to be developed into a multi-use commercial condo structure that, if gone unchecked, will tower more than 10 feet above the tallest building on our street. It is through the gross mishandling of this project as a piecemeal mess that has forced this aberration upon our neighborhood. This attempt to combine a commercial parking lot, 11 luxury units, and various other compensations, all within a 36-foot high mammoth building, should never have been considered and, will, and would not have been if requests for this project had been looked at as a whole by the planning department. This uncohesive planning approach has created a snafu of giant proportions, 36, 36 feet tall to be exact. And as yet, we still do not know what the environmental impact will be should this project go through. I ask you today that you pull out all the stops and do whatever is possible to at the very least mitigate or at best reverse the damage that this project will cause to our neighborhood. My neighbors and I fight and will continue to fight to keep our neighborhood safe, charming, and most importantly, close-knit. We welcome development that is reasonable and respectful and respectful of the characteristics that make our neighborhood just that, a neighborhood, and all that implies. Thank you very much. Betty Walker. Yes, my name is Betty Walker, and I'm a third generation owner of the properties at 6511 and 6512 Leland Way. 
and I grew up on the property and have been in the neighborhood for 65 plus years. So I've seen a lot of changes, both good and bad. Uh, this is a very special neighborhood in Hollywood. It's a quiet street, it's a small street, and we've tried to maintain the character and integrity of the neighborhood for a lot of years now, and it's due to, I would say, the very special residents and longtime owners that have been in the neighborhood for so many years. There's a very high degree of integrity on their part to, to maintain and to help. However, now, uh, we are in a time where we really need to call upon you to protect the integrity of our neighborhood and establish in your evaluation and resolution safeguards that will, in, will mitigate and protect us from the negative impacts that could occur from this massive project that is in progress. Uh, we are against the dual usage of this property. Do not want it to be commercial and residential as well, uh, and entering and exiting from Leland Way. It should be a one-use property. And in closing, I would like to say developers do come and go, but the residents are left to stay and to maintain and must actually be responsible and deal with the consequences of your actions, which is very important. Thank you, Thank ma'am. You. Scott Campbell, William Ross, uh, Scott Campbell here? Okay, William Ross, and after William Ross will be Isabel Beruta. Uh, council members, Office of the Council President. My name is Bill Ross. Myself and Ms. Bureta are attorneys for the applicant. We would wish to raise a few procedural and substantive issues respectfully for your consideration in this adjudicatory hearing. There have been at least five public hearings prior to the one before your council. We believe the matter of the rear yard setback is improperly before you for the following reasons. First. It was not raised in the Notice of Appeal of August 9, 2009. Second, it was not raised before Plum. Third, the administrative construction of your own planning staff in filing the Notice of Determination on the, deci on the decision of the Area Planning Commission of November 9th specifically references and authorizes the five-yard setback as opposed to the 15-yard setback. As all council members know, the APC decision is a final decision. If there was a doubt about that, it should have been raised before another body of government, the courts, not waited until three hours ago to be raised in this manner before the council. Pragmatically, it assaults the integrity of the density bonus ordinance for affordable housing. There are eight units as a matter of right, three density units, one of which is affordable. All of the council members have at one time or another said that the development standards associated with affordable housing should be applied equally, whether it was one unit or 500 units. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the one unit case. Finally, under the Brown Act, there is no indication that condition number eight of an already final decision of another city council, of another city body, can now be raised before you. For these reasons, we would request adoption of the recommendation of Plum without modification. Ms. Bureta will add issues dealing with general plan consistency and zoning. Thank you, sir. Zone. Ms. Bureta. Good afternoon, council members. I'd like to add, there was a point that was made that developers come and go. Well, this developer is not going anywhere, as he also owns the land to the rear yard that is located at the rear of the property, which is the Cat and Fiddle Restaurant and Pub. It's a commercial property that he also owns and has been there for 30 years. But more importantly, I'd like to point to the fact that the housing element's primary concern for the city of L.A. is to facilitate affordable housing. 
The primary concern is to facilitate by providing the incentives that could allow developers to offset costs in order to build affordable housing. I've often heard that this is only a one unit affordable. This project only includes one affordable unit, but for this developer it's a great cost given that it's only 11 units. It is very clear by the general plan that that is a primary concern of the housing element given the housing crisis. Also, given the economic crisis, I would believe that in this economic climate we would want to facilitate the development for developers that would create jobs and would provide affordable housing for those that cannot afford housing even in this housing market. I'd also like to add that under the state density bonus law, there is express language that says the local body cannot add a development standard that would have the effect of prohibiting the use of the density bonus incentive here by requiring that for each foot the developer is entitled to go up in height, he has to reduce his rear yard. It's negating the purpose of the incentive. If the purpose of the incentive is to reduce costs for the developer to incentivize him by adding this foot at the rear yard for every foot that he goes up, there is no point for the incentive. So it violates not only the local law, but it violates state law. And I respectfully would ask the council members to please consider the economic cost that would preclude the developer from developing the project. Thank, thank you, you very much. Mr. Garcetti. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you to folks who have been so patient this uh, morning, Susan and David and Betty and Maria, um, the applicants' representatives as well. Um, I know it was a busy morning because of the Department of Water and Power. You do live in an amazing neighborhood, and I'm, I'm very proud to represent you in that area because it does have both the best of a city and a village feel together. And preserving that, I think, is very critical in what we do. What is before us today is not SB 1818. I think we could all agree on certain um, issues that have been brought up about improving that to make sure that we have the protections that I know this council intended while allowing us to, to move forward with um, development. I appreciate the words that you said. This is not an anti-development area at all. We've actually stood, I think, well for what the city can uh, do and not take five steps forward, but one step at a time move towards a city that we all uh, can embrace. So Hollywood now where you can go to the farmer's market on Sunday, catch a movie, meet friends for a drink, get on the subway to go to a Lakers game. All that you can do without having to get into a car. And that's a really important part of moving our city forward. I've asked the staff to come forward. I'm not going to go through all the history of, of any mistakes that may or may not have been made. Um, but the recommended action that's been given to us today um, from the planning department, which uh, I don't know if the city attorney wants to chime in on any of the, the, the points that were raised, but maybe it's best not to. I'll uh, defer to their judgment on this. Uh, there was a recommended action, which I'd like to read into the, the record, to require a re rear yard setback condition to read as follows. Um, 9L, prior to the issuance of any permit or final map, the applicant shall submit a revised track map reflecting action on case number ZA 2006. Dash 10260 ZAA dash DB. The rear yard setback shall be five feet for a project of 30 feet in height. For each foot of additional height above the 30 feet, the rear yard setback shall increase by one horizontal foot. I've met with neighbors about this over a long period of time. Our neighborhood council spent a lot of time on this as well uh, to get to a place where folks could get to yes. Um, and I think we've done it in a way that tries to embrace the best of moving forward with the development, but also making sure that it doesn't um, in any way disrupt the community uh, too, too uh, extremely. In terms of process, do we have any problems in terms of what the issues that were raised? Um, I've been told that this is, um, you know, not only legal, it reflects what the APC did. Is that correct? Uh, Garland Chang, Planning Department staff, uh, in, reviewing, in reviewing the tapes, uh, it was the intention of the Area Planning Commission. They were uh, referring to a piece of uh, codification in the municipal code. Uh, Apparently, it did not apply, but it was their intent to apply it, so uh, that's why the, the document is before you. Okay. All right. Mr. Keller? Uh, Kevin Keller, City Planning. Uh, just for the record as well, um, just want to confirm that the item in front of the council today is the tract map. Right. Um, as a tract map, the recommendation is to approve the project, approve the tract map. The one item that um, the, the recent uh, condition addresses is the rear yard only. That was not part of the density bonus. The density bonus was granted in this case. The rear yard is in front of, um, is also not in front of the council, but as part of the tract map, there's an opportunity to address the 
Treasury Yard and essentially make revisions and make it a better project that also is reflective of the Area Planning Commission. As a senior planner, I was at the Area Planning Commission. I'll agree it was a very long hearing. We don't have to go into all of that unless there's more questions. But in our consultations, um, with the points that were raised by the uh, attorney for the case, the appeal is in front of the council. Uh, these, there was not a plum hearing on this matter, so we're having the hearing here in council. That's that's the standard procedure. Right. Uh, the APC, con APC condition is not simply stating five feet as written. It does. Um, refer to other code sections as Mr. Chang referenced. There's an opportunity now to clarify or to add that condition to the track map. And uh, the issue of the Brown Act and other housing um, element um, questions, we feel that um, the project before you does meet and include and meet those um, guidelines. So staff is supportive of it. We appreciate the accommodations the developer has made pursuant to uh, things we've talked about in the council and ingress and egress. I appreciate the work that we've, do we've done, but I definitely side in this case uh, with the community on this last piece. I would move that forward and move the recommended approval. Um, you know, we all have policy work to do on a different matter, which is not before us on improving SB 1818, and some of this is coming out in practice. But in the meantime, this is something that, that will still allow a project to move forward. That was the intent, clearly, of the, a of the APC, and that will also protect the community. So I would ask for your approval. Thank you. As amended, yes. All right. Thank you, Mr. Garcetti. Mr. Clerk, would you please open the roll on this item? Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. Thank you very much. Mr. Parks, uh, item 5 is up now. Thank you very much, Mr. Parks. We're on item five now. Mr. Parks is our first speaker. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, on item five uh, is a very important report from the controller who is going to give us insight as to uh, a variety of things, our uh, uh, annual debt service and a variety of things on our cash flow and some assessment of some of our critical and sometimes very sensitive uh, uh, funding sources that come into the city and to give us some idea of where we're headed for this next fiscal year. And I think we're within a week of having some assessment of our revenue sources for the third quarter of this fiscal year. So we're getting close to that date. So why don't you give us an overview of this report and hit those critical points that you've discussed with us before and also at committee. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Parks, and, and colleagues. I still want to call you colleagues. Um, and I have here with me Bill Lamb, who is uh, not an unfamiliar face here to this uh, group. I think this will be his last March 1st report in the city of Los Angeles, much to our chagrin. Um, you should have received a copy, and we did talk about it in budget committee. Um, by charter section, we are required to provide to the mayor and the council a report on the revenue projections for the upcoming year, uh, primarily uh, to assist in the development of the budget and to outline for you uh, some of the potential challenges that you will face uh, in the budget this year. We meet each year, we meet with lo local economists, um, review the economic forecasts of UCLA, State Department of Finance, State Legislative Analyst Office, and the um, LA County Economic Development Corporation to really compi compile a economic forecast for the coming year. While we believe that we will see a modest economic recovery in the coming year, it would best to be described as slow and gradual. Overall, we expect the city, city's general fund to receive $4.189 billion in revenue next year, which is about $16.8 million less than the $4.206 billion the city is expected to receive this year. In the overall budget, we anticipate receiving $141 million less than what we received uh, this year. Um, while we anticipate the tax revenue for the current year to be dramatically lower in almost every um, category, we project four of the seven economic sensitive revenue streams will actually increase next year. So um, if you happen to have the report on page 12, it does talk about those economic um, revenue areas. Um, and of course, utility users tax, the sales tax, 
the transit occupancy tax and the document transfer tax, we do anticipate uh, an increase next year. Uh, unfortunately, property tax, which is one of the most volatile as well, we anticipate a 2.75% reduction. And because it is the largest source of revenue in that area, um, that is why we see a decreasing uh, revenue projection for next uh, year. Um, we, when you talk about, and, and Bill has frequently, the, the most volatile tax is the city's uh, documentary transfer tax. And if you see on page two, actually, there was a chart that we put together that indicates in 2006, we actually increased, we had a 200 and I think it's $15 million that we received, excuse me, 200, $215 million that we received at that time. Um, and this year, um, we anticipate um, actually 95 million for this year. So that real change, I think, is something that is dramatic uh, going forward. Uh, in addition, um, we anticipate that we will have to borrow $550 million in the tra tax and revenue anticipation notes, the TRAN. This year, we only had to borrow $400 million for cash flow during the current fiscal year. However, we also did interfund transfers, which came up to that almost $550 million uh, as well. The city will have to pay just under $175 million in general obligation bond debt service um, next year, which is an increase of about $7.2 million from the current year. And also, we will be required to pay $399 million in debt service, voter approved and non-voter approved next year, which is about a 59% increase from 10 years ago. Uh, we uh, if you look at it, as I've talked about, the economy is recovering. It will take time for the revenues to return to the pre-recession uh, levels. And so, although, again, we see some increase, we do not see it uh, an increase in our overall budget and anticipate the following year to be on the same track, which is a slow and gradual increase, but not to reach to the height of our uh, revenue projections. Mr. Corbin, give us uh, just an assessment from our last recession, early 90s. How long did it take some of those revenues to come back to what we considered the norm? Before you answer that, Mr. Alarcon needs to make an announcement about his committee. To, I just wanted to announce that the 1 o'clock uh, jobs committee hearing will be held uh, five minutes after uh, the completion of the council meeting. Thank you. Please proceed. Thank you. It, it took about five years uh, for the recovery. One other thing that's important to note is we talked about the TRAN and the borrowing and the interfund transfers that we've had to do this year to meet our cash flow. Um, in the past, we've had our fire hydrant funds, we've had SPRF funds, um, and we've had a at least a some reserve fund in which we could do interfund transfers. That will not be available to us next year. Um, and so that is an important, I think, point to make as we look at this next year's budget. And, and and would you consider 92 to be a milder recession than what we're going through now? I'll let, I'll let Bill. He was, he was in that. Uh, what, what the economists here are indicating that this, this recession is the worst downturn since the Great Depression. And, and so 1992 was bad, but it was not as bad as this one. And part of what we're looking at is a lot of the city's revenues are lagging indicators. Our sales tax um, is much of it's based upon uh, how people buy. And with high unemployment, uh, they, they are not as available to buying. Our property tax, uh, we still see another couple of years of uh, decreasing uh, because of the lag in the property values. Uh, and so uh, because the, the, the property tax is such a large uh, percentage of our revenue and is, is such a uh, big contributor, relatively small percentage increases turn into uh, large dollar decreases. Let me ask Rex from the CAO's office to come up. Rex is the other part of the assessment team that gives us the CAO's perspective on projecting our revenues. And just like to see, Rex, uh, from your standpoint, where is the CAO's office in, in relationship to the controller's report, or is there new or different information since that report was uh, created? The, 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 better news. Yeah, the controller's report fairly outlines exactly what the situation is now. What we're looking at is we'll have another month to look at. Rick, speak at that. Rick, speak at that microphone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
it's a very good foundation for starting next year's budget. And what we'll have is a couple of months later receipts, and so there'll be fine-tuning. But it's not going to be a whole lot better than what we're seeing from the controller's report. Okay. And then when can we expect the third quarter uh, figures to come out? Well, we're starting to get those now. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen the sales tax results for the Christmas quarter, and they're exactly like we saw. The good news, it's not any worse than we thought, but they're down 6% from the prior year. And, and, and the holiday uh, sales tax is really a barometer, in some instances, of, of the, how businesses are doing and also a trend line. We're at the six-month mark. So it gives us some trend line as to what we can expect the rest of the fiscal year? Yeah, absolutely. It's the best overall economy-sensitive revenue as the sales tax go, all of the economy, one way or another, will move in that direction. Okay. And then uh, the, my final question is that, and I, I asked Ms. Grew to do this for us on this next year, I'm really concerned, as we were last year, we sat on the committee, that we had a $4.4 .4 billion projection. And within six months, we're about 180 to 200 under that. This year, you're saying we may be right under the $4.2 billion, and that we really would like to make sure that we're very, very cautious with that, because with all the things going on, I'd rather that somewhere in the fiscal year we may have a couple of dollars more than we thought than spend the whole year trying to cut back on the encumbrances and the, the budgets that we give the general managers. I think as we mentioned in, in Budget Committee, um, Mr. Parks, was the um, importance of um, updating more on a, a regular basis as well um, with the FSRs that have come up on a more regular basis and for us um, from the City Controller's Office to provide cash flow information as much as possible. I did note in the concerns in the March 1st um, one issue which I know you've been debating today, which is going forward. The you know When we collect the uh, information as does Rex, we depend on others to provide us with some of their assumptions. Um, the Department of Water and Power provided to us an assumption of um, 200, 257 million dollars that they would be providing to us as a transfer next year. Yeah. That 257 million dollars that they projected included their anticipation that an ECAF would be adopted. So uh, that number may change depending yeah. upon the actions um, that, that take place uh, in the next several months. Yeah, I think you probably listened to the debate today and and I think several things changed since the budget meeting because those uh, concerns about being able to give us the remaining 73 were never articulated. In fact, we were told that within the next couple of months. So our assumption was it wasn't 73 to zero, that it was going to be a portion of the 73 at a minimum, but their goal was to get us to 73. So I'm sure that will all play out in this. Uh, yes, uh, and it was one of the reasons, we, as, as you know, we sent the letter in February mm -hmm. to the mayor and council, which indicated this was the first time the Department of Water and Power had not adopted the full amount, $220 million, um, at, at one time, that they'd only adopted 147. Um, so that we operate with what we have in hand um, and what's been acted on, uh, not checking the mail. And, and I think, and this is my final question, I think one of the things that was even more of a concern is when you look at their, their report that they came up with, these, this surplus is based on 08, 09. So you're assessed, you're, you would assume that they were making judgments when they say 247, that they were based on funds already in hand. And so this is a kind of a new twist to give us a portion and then say, we got to go and raise a fee in order to get you from the 0809 surplus to be able to make that whole. And that's kind of the confusing part that we dealt with today. And this was, the, again, the first time and I asked Bill, could he remember in any of his years of service in the controller's office where the full amount hadn't been adopted? We know that they send, they adopt the full amount and they send it based on that cash flow too. We don't get one full, you know, one big chunk of, uh, of money. It comes over that period of time. Um, and, and that's why we sent the letter in February. We, we felt that was unique that they had not done that in the past. Thank you very much. Mr. Lavange. Thank you very much. Uh, Controller Gruel, on our issues here, what are the, some of the dates the city receives revenue uh, as far as the taxes? It's not all coming in every day. Just like water power doesn't get everybody's bill on uh, one day, they spread it over each, you know, they, they circulate. Do we, do we have those dates? 
We do, and I'll ask the two gentlemen to respond as well. Right. But generally, I mean, the reason that we have to go for the TRAN um, in the end of this fiscal year is to cover us. Now, to say the TRAN, first... only because I know not everybody out there on Channel 35 land, like Mr. Rosendahl likes to call it, knows TRAN is an acronym for... Uh, for all the center <laughs> tax, tax, tax and revenue tax and revenue anticipation notes. Right. It's the TRAN. Right. See, I've called it TRAN for some right, reason. I, know. I said earlier what it was. Yeah, I got it. But the, the TRAN, so we go and borrow money um, for this year to, to cover us during the time in which we don't receive our revenue. So property tax, for example, we don't start getting until after you, we all pay our property tax in, the, in April. In, uh, well, in December yeah. and, then, right. and then coming into April. Um, similarly, as mentioned, the sales tax, which Bill mentioned, you know, a big amount of that comes through the holiday um, time as well. So uh, that's why we're always looking at our cash flow um, different than what we've budgeted for the year because our cash flow is very much dependent upon the source of revenue. We normally don't get the DWP transfer until this time as well. Right. Is there anything radical you think we could do if, I mean, it would be radical in the sense of trying to budget before, because how much does the transfer cost, or the trans cost? The tax we were talking about, the borrowing. It, it depends on the borrowing. Do we know what this year's amount was? Uh, it would just be a, a guess. I don't know. Uh, what it exactly was. Um, and do and most cities do this or just major cities do this? The, the, a lot of cities do it because the, our expenditures tend to be flat or level throughout the year. Our, our basic uh, expenditure is salary and salary related. Right. Uh, the, our, our revenue is skewed towards the second half with property taxes, December, January, April, and May, business tax uh, basically in March, uh, power revenue transfer in the second half of the year. So we're short about $600 million in the first half of the year in terms of revenue versus expenditures. Uh, on the other hand, on the second half of the year, we generally uh, have more revenue than expenditures. And uh, we've historically been that way when... Uh when uh, Charlie Navarro was the controller, has that always been the procedure? It, it, it's always been, but what we used to have is we had a lot more part, pots of money. And so what, what the mayor and council have been doing over the years is from a budget standpoint, they be, have been better utilizing the amounts of money that have been available. Uh, the special pots of money have been being decreased. That has exacerbated the problem that we have with our cash flow because we don't have the same internal borrowing sources anymore. Right. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. for that question. Uh, all right. Thank you very much. Um, there's no additional speakers in the queue. Uh, Mr. Clerk, would this be a note and file? Uh, Council can adopt the committee report, which is noting and filing. All right. Uh, please open the roll on this item. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Twelve ayes. Thank you very much. Next item. Council has motions for posting and referral. Motions are posted and referred. There are excuses on the desk. Councilmember Cardenas requests to be excused Tuesday, March 30th, to leave at 12.30 for city business. That meets council policy. That'll be without objection. Councilmember Zine requests to be excused Friday, July 30th, for personal business. That meets council policy. Again, without objection. Councilmember Perry requests to be excused Tuesday, April 6th, to leave at 11.15 for city business. That meets council policy. All right. That'll be without objection. And Councilmember Garcetti requests to be excused Friday, July 2nd for personal business that also meets council policy. Fine, that'll be without objection. That clears the desk. Uh, members, are there any announcements? Any announcements? Mr. Labange. I just thought it was a, a great day on Sunday for the Los Angeles Marathon and uh, very spirited to see the public come out and cheer the 25, 26,000 runners and also uh, the many, many runners from our Students Run LA program. Mr. Parks. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to announce to the public that the uh, MTA is holding five meetings uh, during this week that deals with the uh, construction of the Crenshaw Line. And for information, if they call 213-891-2965. And also, MTA has put out a, another notice that they will be doing drilling and construction work on Crenshaw between the dates of March 22nd through April the 7th. And again, an another number to call on uh, anyone interested in that information is 213-923-6271. Any other announcements? All right, would you all please rise for adjourning motions?
Any adjourning motions? Mr. Huizar and then Mr. Labonge. Thank you, Madam President. And colleagues, I ask that we adjourn today in memory of Victoria Sanchez Rodriguez. Uh, Ms. Rodriguez was born in a ranch just outside Nochislan, Zacatecas, in Mexico. The youngest of six children, she was fortunate to graduate from the sixth grade, a luxury that for many from that area is difficult to achieve. Having lost her mother at the age of six, Victoria had to grow up quickly and help support her other siblings and her father. After graduating elementary school, she went to work making piñatas and ice cream, along with being a general clerk at one of the local stores. It was during that time that she met her husband, Guadalupe Sanchez. In 1975, she gave birth to her son, Jaime Sanchez. Soon after, her husband made the journey to the United States in hopes of establishing a foundation in which he and his wife could raise their son. Victoria and Jaime emigrated in 1978 to join Guadalupe, who had settled in the San Fernando Valley. In 1980, Victoria gave birth to her next son, Ulysses Sanchez. Ulysses is an active resident in CD14 and also a former employee of myself and the mayor. Victoria played an active role in the education of her children, making sure that they had the environment and support necessary to achieve in their studies, from attending school functions, checking in with their teachers, to keeping her children away from surrounding negative influences. She always made sure that they were taken care of and felt her love. Her love and devotion extended to all her family and members and neighbors. Her nieces and nephews would always look forward to visiting Victoria's home to enjoy her laughter and her home cooking. She would always give cookies and treats to the children in the neighborhood as she saw that many of them did not get such treats in their own homes. Victoria will be remembered as a woman who always carried herself with dignity, self-respect, and an endless love for her family. For these reasons, she was loved and admired by many and why she will be missed by all who knew her. She is survived by her brother, Agustin, her sisters, Ramona, Chuy, Jovita, her husband, Guadalupe, her sons, Jaime, and Ulysses, and, their, and her grandson, Gail. The rosary for Victoria, Victoria will be held 6 to 9 tomorrow night at Felipe Bag's Mortuary at 1930 East 1st Street in Bowen Heights. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Huizar and Mr. Lamont. Members, I ask for you to enjoy the memory of Fess Parker. You all know he lived to be the age of 85, better known for his portrayal as the Quincy Westerner, the tall, rugged, Texas-born athlete turned actor. He studied at USC and began his television career probably right near the steps of City Hall in Dragnet. He portrayed his famous frontiersman as Davy Crockett and Daniel Boone. Later on, he worked in the vineyards, developing wine, and also uh, in the hotel business. He survived by his wife, Marcella, son, Eli, and daughter, Ashley. I ask for you to adjourn in memory of Fess Parker. And also, I ask for you to adjourn in memory of Mark Ferber, who passed away uh, at a young age. Uh, he was born in Los Angeles in 1950, and he loved Hollywood Bowl, where he began working there at 14 years old. After graduating from Hollywood High School, he got a job as an errand boy, and 45 years later, uh, his career at the Bowl, uh, he uh, was succumbed to an accident recently. He survived by his wife, Suzanne, as well as their five-year-old son, Daniel. He was much loved by everyone at the Bowl. Please adjourn in memory of Mark Ferber. Thank you. Any adjourning motions on this side of the horseshoe? All right, Mr. Clerk, would you please call the roll? The meeting is adjourned. Get a, Thank get you. A cup of those, uh, Sorry. Cup of two. Plum will begin at 2:30. Plum and budget.